it, it is, but it's not in the way that you think it is. There is a 23 page document that I have prepared that I have forwarded to both of your email and I would appreciate if we could share the screen at some point later, but there's, there's a reason for this. And let me, let me explain. I object <laughs> to this. We, will, we should be provided with evidence. Uh, I did not case, get to voir dire, <laughs> to voir dire this you're not, witness. You're, you're not going to request to, trust a, me. I request a continuance, uh, your honor. Hey folks, welcome to the smoke and tire podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by off the record. We love off the record over here because they provide a valuable service to the enthusiast community. They help you keep your license. Every single one of us here has got pulled over, ticketed on some trumped up charges. Only the suckers plead guilty. You don't want to plead guilty because it puts you into his whole ecosystem of the courts, the cops, the insurance companies. It's all bad. Use off the record instead. Don't plead guilty. You get a ticket, big or small, call off the record. Any moving violation. You don't even call. You go to offtherecord.com slash TST, or you use code TST10 on that off the record app. All you got to do is make an account and uh, snap a photo or a scan of that ticket. They, they ask you a few questions describing the scenario, and then off the record connects you with a qualified attorney in the jurisdiction that you got the ticket it in and they help you fight that ticket. You don't have to go to court. You don't have to appear anywhere. You don't really have to do anything, frankly. Off the record's got something going with me right now and I don't have to do squat. They send me an email update once in a while. Here's the deal. Here's what's going on. It's no big deal. And then you know what happens? They're going to send you uh, uh, an email very likely that your ticket was either dismissed or drastically reduced to something with no points. They have an amazing success ratio uh, they're great people. They have all kinds of coverage across the entire uh, United States. They can help you in almost any jurisdiction possible. So download that Off The Record app and use code TST10 or go to offtherecord.com slash TST. Those codes will get you 10% off all legal services with Off The Record. Every single week, I get an email from somebody. I get a, a, a DM on Instagram from somebody. They used Off The Record. It saved their backsides, and they'll save yours, too. Offtherecord.com slash TST or code TST10 on the Off The Record app. All right, folks, it's that show. It's Jason Camisa. There's been some drama, and this is the show where we talk it out. Jason Camisa is on the Smoking Tire podcast. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the program today. Um, I did a bad thing, as I do sometimes, because I'm an a, a, a extremely imperfect and sometimes disastrous human being frequently self-sabotaging um, and uh, most of you know that if you listen to this program but I think it's important to start the show uh, and Jason Camis is here with us and, and he's listening on the uh, on the on the line right now um, you know with an apology to Jason um, and and Jason and I had this conversation on the phone while I was in Finland but I'm gonna have it again um, so everybody can hear it um, I made two mistakes I mean, I may have made factual errors in the podcast where I talked about his Cybertruck review last week, but, but that's not the mistakes that I necessarily want to talk about first. I really, um, I, I think I made two, two real mistakes that I think I need to publicly apologize for. Um, one was um, uh, the, the, the failure journalistically to talk about my friend's video um, and 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 make it do make the whole the whole thing about it without calling him first. Um, that's not only a failure from a from a, a, a professional level, but on a friend level. Jason is my friend. I hope that he will continue to be my friend, and I do value uh, my friendships more than I value any dumb car um, or what I have to say about any any dumb car. Um, and, and that was a, that was a failure on my part and I apologize to, to Jason and I apologize to the audience, uh, for doing that. And I also made another mistake, which is that rather than just talking about the, the car in that episode, I made it about Jason and I made it about his video. 
And I don't think that's a thing that friends should do. I don't think that's necessarily fr- thing a thing that colleagues should do, um, even if they are, you know, quote, competitors in the space. I, I think that um, because only a small number of people got access to the to the truck and so many people were asking me about my thoughts, I I. I felt like I was working with what I had, but but in hindsight, that was a, a, a terrible mistake. I shouldn't have done it. Um, I could have um, just said, you know, Jason made a great video and I disagree with some of the things that he said, and it could have been one sentence and moved on. And instead I made like a whole thing about it. And I, I don't know if anyone, including Jason, will believe me, but I almost immediately regretted it and that and before I knew Jason was upset, but I did almost, uh, almost immediately. I regretted doing the whole thing, and I re- and I regretted it for that reason, um, and 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 so I want to just take the start of the show to acknowledge my mistakes, um, and to ask Jason uh, for uh, as a friend for his forgiveness for those transgressions and and to put it right at the beginning of the show so all of the audience can hear and I hope that um, Jason will choose to remain my friend because I, I really do enjoy his company as a, as a great human and um, and and I invited him on the show now to uh, to say whatever he fucking wants <laughs> and so hi and now I'm really pissed because now you've done ruined all the fucking drama that everyone thought was going to happen here, including me. Um, no, I mean, look, th- thank you for, thank you for that apology. I do actually believe it because I heard the the tone in your voice when you called me, you, I mean, there was no, like you started the conversation with, I think you're mad at me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm really fucking disappointed. And you just were like, I fucked up. I'm sorry. And went down this, shame spiral to use a clueless term um and i was shocked i i didn't i didn't expect that and um i think that your reaction there and then your reaction now really shows your character and so if anyone wants to call that into question use this as an example this is like this is how you act like a gentleman when you called on something when you're called on something that I'll say you probably shouldn't have done. Um, and so really, I, I respect the hell out of that. And thank you. Um, you ruined half of my speech, which was prepared to just beat the shit out of you. Um, well, but look, the reality I in, is I was in Finland in the dark by myself and I've had days. I mean, we talked on a, a, t- a Tuesday or whatever the fuck day it was. Uh, and, and, and I've had days to think about it since then. And I've been thinking about almost nothing but sitting here and letting you beat the shit out of me, which you, which maybe I deserve. And 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 by all means, the 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 floor is yours. So I'm ready to have the shit beat out of me, and I earned it. If that's what's about to happen, <laughs> it, it is. But it's not in the way that you think it is. There is a 23-page document that I have prepared that I have forwarded to both of your email, and I would appreciate if we could share the screen at some point later, but there's, there's a reason for this. And let me, let me explain. I <laughs> object to this. We, will, we should be provided with evidence. Uh, I did not case, get to voir dire, <laughs> to voir dire this you're not, witness. You're, you're not going to request to. Trust a, me. I request a continuance, uh, your honor, in order to no, examine bitch, the document. No, no, listen, um, the, the, let me, let me explain my position first and then we can talk about the, the, this whole thing. I'm not attacking you as a person. In fact, I'm going to continue to commend you for even letting me on the podcast. I have witnessed as of you, the transition from print magazine to this, this new world of social media. And I really appreciate that the audience benefits from multiple different points of views, multiple different presentation styles, multiple opinions. Um, and I, I think the world's a better place for all of us, especially if we get along. I mean, I just realized I'm wearing a, an M539 restoration shirt. Um, I wear Hoonigan stuff. I wear, you know, I support the Throttle House guys. Anything we can do to all work together, I think is better for the overall audience. My personal brand is hardcore factual journalism. And, and the, the hard part for me is kind of trying to advise people to separate out my 13-year-old sense of humor and, and the, the silly little entertainment stuff that I try to put in there in, in my reviews from the fact that 
the primary goal is fact-based automotive journalism, right? So in this case, the reason that I was so upset on this and the reason that, I, that I've done nothing for the last couple of days but prepare a 20-something page document for you is because you didn't come for my sense of humor. You didn't say, man, Jason got fat and old. You didn't say Jason shouldn't have sat there on the on the back of a Cybertruck with a four foot long windshield wiper and pretending it's his dick or a, um, a, f a fishing rod or something. That's fine. Those are both good decisions, by the way. I support okay, both good. of those. <laughs> Glad we're on the same. Look, we're both 13 year olds. And if you um, think I'm I, in a position to call anybody fat. <laughs> you look good. You look like you lost weight. I'm annoyed about that because I uh, you lost it. I found shame it. is a hell of a drug, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I look at myself on camera and you'd think I wouldn't eat, but no, but in all seriousness, the, the thing was, the reason that upset me is you didn't come for me as a person, which is fine. You came for the integrity of my journalism. And that is something that I really want to talk to you, you both about, because I, I would have thought, and I think where, where you tripped up, if you tripped up and I'm not, I don't want to like, this is not going to be a, a beat up on Matt thing was go ahead and talk about my style of journalism. But if you don't see something, if you see something that doesn't seem right, like, hey, I know Jason. Jason's not fucking paid by Tesla, right? Jason's not getting a fucking paycheck or a cut from anybody else. Why does it seem that way? I would I would want you as part of your job as a journalist to call and say, what the fuck, dude? Um, and so I can explain myself. And the reason that's so important is by not calling out me for being an idiot, but for calling out the facts that I was using, you opened the door for everyone else to attack my credibility. And you opened the door for conspiracy theories like I'm getting paid, which is for the record, absolutely fucking not the case and has never been. Um, and you know that, we're journalists, you know. They're, no, even the people who were supposed to get paid by Tesla didn't get paid. I think they owe Marcus <laughs> Brownlee four founders edition roadsters from his referral codes. No, that's funny. <laughs> um, that's funny. But you know, I have all the money sitting right here that Tesla gave me, and it's a it's in a bag somewhere that I can't find because it's fucking zero. But the 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 whole crux of this sort of debate between us really needs to come down to two things. Number one, we need to be able to better as a as a community and as a country on this one, and probably as a world, do a better job at separating opinion from fact. And the great irony of this, and I'm not going to get too, I don't want to get into politics, but the great irony of this, I know your political leadings, you've made those very clear, um, is that the, the whole idea of fake news and the whole idea of alternative facts um, actually exists. And it exists not because Donald Trump says it exists. It exists because we know we lost the checks and balances from a mature media organization that we used to have. And it used to be like when I was on staff at Run Track or Automobile, if I said something that was not necessarily correct, I had some nerd in another office going, yeah, you're going to have to prove this to me. And, you know, and if I said something that was not it, that was out of bounds with what my job was as an automotive journalist to report the facts on a car, I had someone go, mm, you know who I'm talking about, mm, cut this immediately, it's horrible, right? That was Joe. And we've lost that. And so I think we need to do a better job at self-policing, at fact-checking our own stuff, and also being very clear between this is my job as a journalist, so I'm going to make a car review as a journalist, but then I'm going to go over here and do my podcast. And I'm not going to call myself a journalist in the podcast. I'm going to say I'm taking my journalist hat off, and this is no longer Jason Camisa, the car reviewer who's sticking to the facts about the car. This is Jason and this is, okay, a small version of me, right? But this is me with my opinions and not ever blur the line between fact, which is what would be in a road test, and opinion, which is what would be in a column. And I so- I think that's really, uh, man, I see where you're coming from there. And, and, and in theory, I agree with you. I just, I don't know, I don't know how to, how to logistically do that and have it be, uh, I don't know, con consistent or, or, or believable. It's, you know what you know what I mean? Like you're not you're not alone in this question. I mean, this is a new world of me, and I hate to be like, oh, the old guy, but this is a new world of social media where people look. Look, the result of of your video was that people came away from that saying Jason was paid, Jason was wrong, and now I believe different things. Right? The point that I need to drive home on on this particular case is you were for lack of a better word, 
opining. You were spouting off opinions on a truck that you've never seen in person, you've never sat in, you've never driven, and you didn't have access to insider information. And the way you presented that was as fact. And so now your audience went away from this thinking, here's a fact. The fact is the 48 volt system doesn't, doesn't really do anything. The fact is Tesla didn't get 5.4 stars on the, on the crash test. Well, those aren't actually facts, right? So there, there, um, there are in the 20 something pages, I, de- I do address a lot of things that you're right at pointing out. Like, let's start a de- debate about the 5.4 star things because that kind of happened, but didn't, but then kind of did, but then didn't. And I want you to understand my motivation in, in saying that to begin with. But, um, but we got to be really, really careful. You and I and Throttle House and all of, all of the people whose faces are now on the screen have a responsibility to differentiate between this is my opinion and here's a fact. And the reality is that road test of the of the Cybertruck was a road test. In in magazine terms, that would have been a preview, right? So I had access to the engineers. I could ask them anything I wanted. I had I watched them build a couple of prototypes. I watched a crash test. I watched the durability lab stuff. I got pieces of the thing to hold in my hand. I could ask any questions, and then I got to spend two days with it. And that was my report from it. There was no opinion in there. I mean, the opinion is, do I like the Cybertruck? No. Do I want one? No. But that's not my job. Job as Jason Camisa of Icons is here to put something in perspective. Next week, you'll see us a, a Mustang Dark Horse episode of Icons where I do nothing but basically grab it by the testicles, cup it slightly, stroke it, and lick it. I mean, it, I gave the car a really big blow job because from a journalistic perspective, that is... A, a, a 10 out of 10 home run bullseye hit to what that car should be. Do I want one? Fuck no. Um, but I'm not, I'm not important. And I don't have enough ego to think that people are paying attention to me because of what they, Jason wants. They don't even know who Jason is. They want to know, they want to hear about my access to cars. And then they want to learn about those cars. They're not here for me. And I think I think cautious. people go to you because they trust your opinion. I think that's why. Oh, they, no, 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 they trust my opinion, but so they don't. I think, I think opinion, they are there for you. But my opinion is not based on me. That's the thing is you guys know a slice of me. I know a slice of you guys. Um, but there's so much more to our lives and our personalities than than just what we put on camera. I play a role, right? As an actor, as a um, uh, automotive journalist, I'm really a bit actor. I go to a, a product presentation by a car company and they say, well, this is what this car product is intended to do. And so I go and drag. I put myself in the mindset and physical size and whatever else of the of the person that it's intended to do. And I review it as such. And I think that's a different per, a different perspective than than you give, Matt. I mean, you're you you made your name on one takes, which is just you talking about your experience and people like that. Um, but I think that's not real journalism. That's observation. And that's great. There's a place for it in the world. And I do not want to insult that. I respect the hell out of that. But I think there's a time when we have to look and say, okay, now I'm being a journalist and I'm being objective. And I don't care whether Elon's a cunt. I don't care whether Elon's savior of the planet. He's not relevant in this discussion because I'm talking about this product and I'm giving a product consumer product review versus I'm talking to you off camera and saying, you know, man, Elon is just my fucking savior. I have pictures of him all over the house, right? This is not the case. Um, do, do you see my point? Folks, got to take a quick um, break. Omaha Steaks, dude. Omaha Steaks are sweet. They sent me the meats, big cuts, filet mignons, burgers, even some desserts, some apple pies. It was awesome. Shows up frozen right into the freezer, and then I thaw it out. Get it on the on the on the cast iron, some seasoning, and I am good to go. Omaha Steaks is nationally recognized quality, great send uh, to send as a gift to uh, friends and family. Uh, Omaha Steaks was started in 1917. It's been being run by the same family from all the way back then, 106 years. They've got a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Uh, if it thaws before it gets to you or the meat isn't up to standards, they will handle it to make you happy. 
happy. All you got to do is go to omahasteaks.com and save off, save 50% off site-wide. Plus, if you use pro, promo code TIRE at checkout, get an additional 30 bucks off your order. Send tender, juicy, butcher-cut fillets, mouth-watering burgers, gourmet jumbo franks, or even easy-to-prepare meals uh, that are ready in a flash. Omaha Steaks is ready to ship your order right away, so shop early and beat the shipping rush. Go to omahasteaks.com. Use promo code TIRE at checkout. Omaha Steaks is a gift from the heart, a gift that will be remembered with every unforgettable bite. Order with complete confidence confidence today knowing you're getting the very best. Go to omahasteaks.com and take advantage of 50% off site-wide plus promo code TIRE at checkout to get that extra 30 bucks off your order. There may be a minimum order required. Now, back to the show. Um, do, do you see my point? Yeah, I, I do. I, I do. And your, your point is valid. And you said a version of this on the phone with me the other day. You're, you're here to talk about the truck, what it is, and 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 the and some share some things about it that you learned and that the people do do not know, and that that in this particular uh, instance, it is, it is not your job to um, provide any sort of uh, uh, what you would call political context of the company, and you you said Elon. I think that Elon and Tesla are very intertwined because of Elon. He 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 set himself yeah. up for that, and so oh, yeah. and so. I think that it's that it's that at this point it's impossible to separate the two. Um, you know, he he. If we were in a courtroom, we would say he, Elon opened the door, Your Honor, uh, to this, mm-hmm. um, and so. I, I absolutely understand your point, and that's why the second part of my apology to you was that I shouldn't have, for lack of a better phrase, knocked your hustle. And I don't mean hustle in a in – a, in a, the connotation that I mean, I shouldn't have knocked your gig. Once you explained what you just explained to me on the phone, I thought about that for not even very long, and I said, you know what? If I want to be the person who cont- who is going to contextualize every product against whether the company has been honest or dishonest about its past products, I'm comfortable being that person. But if Jason doesn't want to do that and instead wants to focus on here is a truck, here is what you should know about it, I, I made it my job – to criticize you for doing that, and I shouldn't have done that. I should have just let you talk about the truck, and I could talk about the truck in the in the context of is full self driving fake? Is stainless steel uh, front noses uh, good for pedestrians? Is this mm-hmm. is this is this not? And can we trust what Tesla says about it at face value based on past statements? But I should not have put that on you. It's not, you know, it's not. I appreciate that. But and and let me I'll argue with you for a second, because I think this is a perfect segue to go into the truck, which is probably what most people are here for. Um, The all I would ask is that that you remember that as a journalist, you you do have the right. I mean, look, I joked in one of the one of the bullet points. Neither of us is Christian Amanpour, right? We're not going around the world. Uh, I don't know, speak making, German. Well, she's uh, she's uh, Lebanese, which I thought you were. Anyway, it doesn't matter. No, I mean, um, sorry, that was a dumb the, American yeah, joke. Um, I apologize. I don't know. The rest of the world don't exist. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, you know, I I feel like we need to have our lanes and we need to stay in them and we need to define our boundaries. And if I'm going to be an automotive expert, which self-proclaimed, haha, um, then I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that I'm an expert in that, and I'm I'm gonna admit that I'm not an expert in politics and sociology and and economics and all the rest of this stuff. And the only thing I would say is, if you're gonna hold Tesla to those standards of whether of whether the company has a conscience and is doing different things, please just remember to apply that to all companies equally. And to that point, uh, Your Honor, there is one of the um, one of the one of the pages. I don't even know, Zach. Sorry about this, but I, I sort of called you out on that because I think that was 
that was really unfair to Tesla. Now, let me let me just state for a second. I'm not a Tesla fanboy. I don't own a Tesla. I don't own Tesla stock. I have no vested interest in either way. I have gone on record to say that the Model S Plaid track tuning is, quote, dangerous. Um, I am happy to dish out tea when it fucking needs to be dished, and I'm happy to give praise where it needs to be. But I try, and I'm saying I always get there, to be to be at least fair uh, uh, to everyone. And so what you were talking about, for example, was, was whether the company's conscience, you know, sort of whether you can believe what they're saying. And the best example there, it's in the fucking doc, sorry, Zach, is I was looking at the, this, um, you said Tesla has 30 EPA violations, um, for example. It was 39. Fuck? Right. Okay, here it is. Okay, time code one, <clears throat> um, time code one hour, 35 seconds. Yeah. Uh, Tesla took, um, te used, the quote was, Tesla took money for an unknown number of 2020 roadsters that they have not delivered. There is over 30 EPA violations at the Fremont factory. They are majorly involved in union busting. They ran a 2019 massive Bitcoin pump and dump scam. To me, that is the context by which we have to look at the Cybertruck. And so what well, I did- I'll stand by that. Okay. All right, fair. I'm, and I'm not going to, by the way, I'm not going to yeah, dispute any of those way, facts. By the way, uh, the EPA website, Zach, has up settled with Tesla over Clean Air Act violations. They paid a $275,000 penalty. Perfect. That's great. I, I am, for the record, I did not, I'm not discounting any of those assertions. However, in August, Ford paid a $7.8 million Clean Air Act settlement for, for Econolines. And if I look up Ford's record, Ford has paid $563 million in penalties since 2000. That's a lot. I mean, yeah. That's and that's lot. before this year. That's before the, the, the $7.8 million in August. So I, my point only in that is just to say, okay, everyone's putting Tesla in the spotlight because Elon can't keep his fucking mouth shut, frankly. Um, and so we judge the company harshly. But I like I thought this morning, oh, Matt's going to bring up, oh, they just recalled 2 million cars. Right? Fair point. They did. They did. They, they did. did. Yeah. All, all of them sold in America. Yeah, all of them. Every all one of them. them. Every single did you know one. that in October, I think it was October, Toyota recalled 1.8 million RAV4s. And unlike the Teslas, which will be over the air updated like that, the RAV4s have to all go into a dealership to get a new battery. Sure. We don't report on that because recall recalls are no big deal until it's fucking Tesla. Well, the, I, 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 I understand the point that you're trying to make. And recalls do happen all the time, and I and I uh, and I agree that an in the dealership recall is more of a pain in the ass than an over the air update. I my Mach E has been recalled for like possibly catching on fire, like, uh, and I've talked about that. Um, and and but I I do think the Tesla recall is significant because the substance of that recall uh, alleges that this that what we've been saying the, this for years, which is that autopilot and full self-driving are actually not uh, working the way that they are marketing it as. And so um, I think that the substance of the recall in this case um, it mirrors what a lot of experts, uh, and supposed experts have been saying about these systems in our use of them and our observing sure. the wor real world. And so, um, but what, I mean, yeah. let's look at the substance of the recall for a second. The recall is not for autopilot being shitty or full self self driving being not what it says the name, what the name says it is. I'll agree with that. It's for being too lax at driver monitoring. Sure. So it's allowing which we, the, which we have been saying for a long time, and people yeah, have been allowed sure. to crawl out of the driver's seat and put weights on the on the thing. And yeah, yeah, absolutely, for sure, I agree with that. But I just don't think that rises to the level of anything greater than Toyota eight one point eight million Toyotas being recalled for blowing up when the battery comes loose because they installed the wrong size battery. Sure. When, and, you, and you say Tesla's not marketing it properly. I would say Toyota markets themselves as everyday people and reliable and all this other shit, and they catch fire. And blow up. And let's not talk about Toyota's safety record with the floor mats situation, which, you know, wasn't Toyota's fault, but they took culpability for it. Um, I just want us all as an industry to remember that we have to treat all of the car companies equally. Um, and I really think, though, I, I hear you. 
I absolutely mm-hmm. hear you. But I, I'm, again, I think um, if we were in a courtroom, I would say they opened the door, Your Honor. They opened the door. And so because they have hint, hung so much um, of the, their company's valuation and the stock and all this. And again, Elon won't shut his fucking mouth. And they put that paint it black video that says the car is just driving itself. The human is only there for legal reasons. I, I think that more than anything, I think it shows the toothlessness of NHTSA. <laughs> I mean, there's another part of there's another lawsuit going on in which Tesla uh, basically has argued uh, th- that that full self driving and autopilot are not misleading because you haven't said anything so far mm-hmm. because you know no. you you let but, us but do it on. before well, and, and also like with the Toyota thing, the, the Toyota was just trying to make a car do its job, which is drive down the road. And then they had this battery issue, or you know, Ford their door stopped opening because of like an electronic issue. But it wasn't a fundamental piece of the marketing of the company, yes. and it wasn't. The, and and I, I, I understand this is a uh, driver attention thing. Their sensors need to be fixed. They need to update that. It's not, they're not pulling back on FSD yet. NIST is not pulling back on that. But one of Tesla's main marketing points for a long time was this thing drives itself. You can kind of chill in the car. It will do so much for you. So, and that Robo-taxi. is what NIST went after. Yeah. Okay. Well. All right. So hold on one second. The first thing, if we're you're saying if we're in a court, the first thing you have to prove in a court is that that court has jurisdiction over what you're talking about and has the ability to judge that. You went right to stock value and marketing, and I'm going to say that's out of bounds. As an automotive journalist, I'm here to report on whether FSD works or not as a level two automation device, and I certainly can say, no, it's not level three, four, or five. Right? It is a autopilot or enhanced highway assist or what everyone else calls whatever they're on. They all kind of suck, um, but it's part of the learning process. And I think the point here is we need to educate the audience and say, Tesla may call it full self-driving, but that's a misnomer. Um, it, it doesn't fully self-drive. It can under certain circumstances, but you cannot trust it. And legally, you were required to take the wheel if anything happens, because if you kill someone, you're legally culpable, full stop. Uh, that's where I think our jurisdiction ends. And then the next thing, the next really important point is, I don't think that needs to expand to a judgment of the company as a whole, right? Oh, I, and so, I, I'm okay judging the company. A company that I, is okay using intentionally misleading marketing, I think is, is a problem. I love this. So Zach, please go to... <laughs> You I don't, right I don't have the PDF pulled up on the screen. Oh, um, shit. Okay. So at 11041, and Matt, again, I'm just, I just want to bring these points up for debate on f- the facts behind everything, right? So you said, quote, I don't trust steer by wire, period. And I certainly don't trust Tesla to do it. I maybe trust Toyota to do it, but f- I definitely don't t- trust Tesla. They don't have a history. They have a history of putting out some pretty janky shit, and they have a history of ignoring redundancies. Okay. Found it funny. That's an opinion, right? All of those things are opinions, right? You don't trust is an opinion by by yeah. by by definition, right? Sure. So let's separate the trust, which you're entitled to trust them or not. And I have my own beliefs, but I'm not going to go into them here. I'm going to say now let's stop looking at tr- at the at the trust, which is an opinion, and let's look at the facts. The fact of the matter is that the Model S created a new combined record for crash test performance when it came out. The Model X has the lowest possibility of injury of any SUV ever tested. In fact, it's second only to the Model S. The Model 3 not only achieved a perfect five-star safety rating in every category and subcategory, but NHTSA's tests also show that it has the lowest probability of injury of all the cars the safety engineer has, as safety agency has ever tested. Then, I'm sorry to drag on like this, but I think it's important to make this point, Model Y received the o- highest overall score among any vehicle ever tested under Euro NCAP's newest, most stringent test protocol. And so what Tesla did then was resubmit Model S, which is the first one, under the new NCAP rating for Europe, and, quote, Model S again received a five-star safety rating and the highest overall score among any vehicle tested in this protocol. So it broke its own record. So that means... Four times in a row, Tesla broke broke the world record. And then once again, those are the facts, right? We can have our opinions on whether Tesla's trustworthy, but 
the fact is the four best performing cars and crash tests in the history of the world all say Tesla on them. Guys, we got to take one more quick break from the show for prize picks. They're our sponsor today, and it's the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just just you against the numbers. Instead of betting thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you just pick more than or less than on two to six players' stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Prize picks is bringing your gifts early this year with the 12 days of Pixmas starting December 14th. There will be a new promotion every day for new and existing customers. The daily promotions will range from payout boosts to discounted projections, such as Phoenix Suns Kevin Durant only needs one point on Christmas Day to make you a winner when placing an NBA Entry. If you want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, you can now find Community Plays under the Promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. And Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So, you know what I'm talking about? Go to prizepicks.com slash tire and use code tire for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks is super, super easy, even if you're a dummy like me. I can't follow the stats. I don't even know half the players. But the ones I do know, all I got to do is pick more than or less than on those projections and watch the winnings roll in at prizepicks.com slash tire using code tire for a first deposit match of up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with prize picks. And now back to the show. You're entitled to your opinion to not trust them. I have driven cars with autopilot. I don't trust them to drive themselves. I'm with you. But, but as a journalist, I have to point out that this company's safety record is off the charts, literally uh, I off think the charts. That you're, I think we're we're blending two things here. I think you're talking sure. about safety in a crash for passengers in Teslas. Yep. And I agree with you. I agree with you. I I I disagree. I I, I agree. I disagree with the use of that 5.4. But for oh, four safest, I can't wait to get there. Yep. Four safest cars in a crash. Okay, you are right. You're absolutely right. But my trust of that system and where I say they don't they don't use redundancies is based on the camera only vision system that does not use radar or lidar or or mm-hmm. those types of redundancies where every other company that is attempting to build a picture of the world in order to have a self-driving or partially self-driving car does use multiple sensor suites to construct mm-hmm. a picture of the the world, um, okay. and so so when I say the the lack of redundancies, and this is not just me who has criticized them for that. There's a lot of people that have criticized them for mm-hmm. saying, "Well, we can do this with just with just cameras," and I think that um, the 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 experts I've spoken with, like Missy Cummings, or people who have worked at um, uh, 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 other quote self driving uh, research firms, have disagreed that or have agreed with me that the uh, that the the lack of redundant sensor suites is probably not it's to be trusted. Probably so that's what. So I was right. not okay. talking about the safety of a passenger in a crash. So, okay. So, no, no, but you were making a good point. I'm going to stick to the facts because frankly, I, I agree, right? I will trust a redundant, a system with redundant sensors more. And for example, I have a car that has AEB automatic emergency braking. That's based on radar. Radar can see through fog. It can see through smoke in ways that cameras can't. And so I have no problem driving like more of a lunatic than I would normally drive with a car with radar based AEB because I understand the limitations of camera based AEB. But on the point of redundancy, there's two kind of two kind of counterpoints that I could make in Tesla's defense. Number one is unlike every other car company in the world, 
so far as I know, except for Lucid, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Tesla's FSD computer and autopilot computer itself, the hardware is fully 100% redundant. There are two power supplies. There are two, two independent computers. Everything has a checksum. And if I remember correctly, there are three network connections between the two of them. Uh, so it can default to one if both of the other ones are ruined. So actually the hardware behind the sensor suite is fully redundant in a way that no one else's are. And yeah, so I but, could say, but if it's only getting one redundant. piece of information, yeah. okay. then it doesn't Perfect, matter. perfect, perfect transition. You're totally right. If it's only getting one inf piece of information and that information is bad, we can't trust it. That latest version of Euro NCAP that, that the Model S scored the highest thing ever on isn't just crash safety, it's crash avoidance. And it scored a perfect score or the highest score ever in every single category, including pedestrian recognition, accident avoidance, AEB, lane departures, and all these other things. So while I can say, I don't know if I'm skeptical about this new technology, and I don't think the right thing to do is to eliminate a radar sensor because of this, this, and this, and this, I have to be very careful as a journalist to, to criticize the whole company and say, well, they're fucking getting rid of radar. So clearly they don't give a shit about people's safety. Okay, I don't think those two things are necessarily related, and that's my point, right? I'm not, um, I'm not debating I, yeah. any of the facts, but I, mm. I think I, I'm not saying they don't give a shit about people's safety. I'm just saying that they're trying to. I mean, look, again, Elon opened the door to this. He went on stage and he told people these cars are going to drive themselves and it's just regulations that they can't. And we've seen all kinds of videos of these cars doing crazy shit. And we've also mm -hmm. seen videos of Cruz and Waymo and, and, and fully censored up, you know, research cars being tricked by traffic cones and, and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, it's so. I think I, I don't think that they are. Uh, <clears throat> how do I say this in a way that that and this is this is my opinion, but I think that Elon has uh, I, I mean, the company has pretty much said that, you know, th that it's OK if the cars crash as long as they crash less frequently than the average driver. I'm not sure the company has said that. In fact, I think the opposite is true. The company has stated that its mission is to make the safest cars on the planet and is constantly feeding out data showing that when autopilot is engaged, the number of actual crashes per mile is something like 12% of that of human driven cars. That's, so I don't think it's their goal. So shared uh, a study that, mm -hmm. that basically debunked uh, the uh, Tesla's claim of that because it eliminated, uh, it did not compare, it compared it to all cars on the road and not just other cars with modern ADAS. It also didn't adjust for driver age, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it also didn't adjust for um, the fact, uh, so, some other facts, and I, I don't have the fucking study. That's okay. I mean, uh, that's an interesting point. I, um, I just wrote it down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go look at that. I will I'll say that I'll no text, study I'll get is it ever from perfect. Niedermeyer, and I'll text it to you okay. later because, because cool. I think you would find it interesting, and I did. I do. I do. I mean, uh, look, uh, no study is ever perfect. Um, you know, when I was looking, when I was looking up the, the sort of data for all the stuff, I was looking at the actual real world deaths per mile traveled per car. Um, can't find it for, for recent stuff. So I was able to find deaths per registered vehicle um, per year per car. And the X3 rear wheel drive has not a single death. So that is the safest car on the fucking road because you go will X, never go die. X3. I bet a Pagani has a better score. I, I bet, bet there's been zero <laughs> Pagani deaths. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but yeah, there are cars that no one has ever died in, right? Yeah. Um, I don't, has anyone died in a Countach this decade? I think not. Safest car on the road. I mean, turn Definitely. turn the key and the fucking thing explodes. And, uh, <laughs> when was the, you line? When um, was the last time someone died in a Countach? It was probably a long yeah. time ago. But I mean, that is, um, so we can look at the studies or we can look at the real world stuff. And if I looked, when I looked, the last time was years ago, admittedly, at Tesla's real world death per per mile traveled and real world death per vehicle registration, it was, they, those cars were safe. Regardless of 
ADAS, regardless of crash safety. We're, and, and by the way, one of the big factors in there is who buys the car, right? Is why Buicks were always safer than Pontiacs, even though they were the same car, um, because the people who bought Buicks were doing seven miles an hour and the people who bought Pontiacs thought they were buying a wide track sports car. Um, and that's marketing, right? And we can criticize the marketing and say, look, this is bullshit. And, and frankly, we should. FSD is not full self-driving. But I don't I don't think it's our job to project that onto the motives and the missions of the company just because Elon is standing there going, la, 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 la. It, do I, I say, as I'll put my political uh, journalist hat on or a corporate advisor hat and say, shut the fuck up. Right. Stop promising things. That's stop it. But that's not an automotive journalist. I'm going to look at the product and be like, is it FSD? No. Does it does it over promise and under uh, deliver? Well, yes. But as a consumer, you need and we're going to be back to the critical thinking as a consumer. You need to understand you can't go to sleep in the back. I don't care whether it says diet Coke or Coke on it. It's bad for me. Right. And I need to understand that as a consumer, that just because it says diet doesn't mean it's going to help me lose weight. And we do have consumer protection bureaus and government governmental agencies that protect against this kind of stuff. They're not your point. They're exactly they're toothless. And so so we got to point it out. But I just there's a difference between pointing out one fact and then and, and expanding it to the company. And I think in your distaste for Elon, which we're not going to get into whether that's valid or not because it's 100% valid. You, are, I want you to have your opinion and I want to have this debate with you about it at some point. But that's between you and me. That's not, by the way, we're pretty much aligned on on most things in that arena. But it's not relevant to a car review. And it's not relevant okay. to whether Tesla is an evil company. That's my... No, I, I, a, whole, a whole company can't be evil. And, and, and even, even fairly horrible companies have have well-intentioned people working there Mm -hmm. and and i agree with the subtext of what you're saying which is that if elon says a whole bunch of bullshit that's not fucking true making the engineers jobs that much harder and making them look bad by being affiliated with him that that i do feel feel bad for those engineers many of whom are well-intentioned many of whom are well-meaning and many of whom would probably have an easier life if he didn't say all this fucking stupid shit certainly i i you're 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 absolutely right there and i and i agree and and to say and and okay maybe it's not fair to say that tesla can't be trusted versus saying Elon Musk can't be trusted. So, 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 okay. But okay. the world has conflated the two so much, you know. And that- I think it's our job to point out that they're not the same thing, right? He, so I joked with, so I was in a meeting with Lars, who's their chief engineer, and we did, we interviewed him at the end of the uh, the day that I spent with the engineers. And unfortunately, none of it made it into the final product because as you pointed out, it was 28, 28 fucking minutes already, and it would have been four hours. But my first question to him, and I'm like, don't worry, I'm not gonna get you fired for your answer is, uh, it's my understanding that your job is to take the psychotic musings of a, of a lunatic and make them reality. And he just burst into laughter. And he was like, it's my job to make dreams come true, right? And that was a perfect, I'm not, that's not a direct quote. I can pull it up if we need it. But that was hilarious. I mean, it was hilarious, but that's what he does. And that's what the whole Tesla team does. And my problem with taking Elon's exaggeration and then saying you feel bad for the engineers is, dude, you shat on all the engineers, right? So, I, and I, I'm sorry to be a dick to keep coming back to this, but I really want to come back to this for a second because what you were refuting there was, were facts and things that the engineers did done do, and they did really well. Like, for example, when I said the line, I'm sorry, I'm just jumping right back in. This is a level of consistency we've never seen in an EV before when we're talking about acceleration. You guys rightfully pointed out, rightfully pointed out that the Taycan is very consistent and that Rimat's Nevera is very consistent. I've driven Nevera. I had an appointment with Rimat's and in fact, a bunch of them flew over from Croatia to do an ultimate drag race replay that let's just say was canceled the morning of the production because of an insurance issue, which is a problem when you work for a fucking insurance company, not to throw anyone under the bus, but we had, you know, sorry. Um, 
But it, Rimat's insistence was that there was a generator on site so that the car was raced at 100.0% state of charge. Not 97, not 99, 100. So I haven't tested that car. What I did do is test the Taycan. And what I found back in the day was that the Taycan Turbo S was fastest over 80% state of charge. I think it was a three second flat, zero to 60. And then it dropped about a 10th and stayed there until uh, I don't even remember where I gave up. What I think you guys are referencing in terms of the, the repeatability was the test that Johnny Smith did together with Porsche on the original Taycan prototype. And what he found was that over 26, I have, I said, I put the link in the PDF over 26 consecutive zero to 200 to zeros. It lost eight tenths of a second. The Cybertruck lost three tenths of a second over 30 plus. And by the way, it wasn't, it, I didn't start at 100. I started at 80 or 78, and we were down to 38 by the end. So when I say this is a level of consistency that's new to EVs, probably what I should have said is this is a level of consistency that I've never seen before in EVs, but I don't believe anything could do that. And by the way, the fastest run that that Cybertruck did to 60, because we're talking about quarter mile and 60 is two different things, um, was, was on 38% state of charge. Like that I've never seen before. So that thing lost lost three tenths to the quarter mile, but but didn't lose a single tenth, tenth down to 38% state of charge. So low that we were worried, like how the fuck are we gonna keep filming? It was fine. And so that's a, that's a point where the engineers who have to deal with Elon's dreaming for, if I, for a, a term got shit on, but they fucking did it. And whether it's the 4860 batteries or whether it's whatever, I've never seen anything like that. So here I am reporting on, holy shit, like this Cybertruck is genuinely fucking unbelievable. I got a report on what I saw. Do I want one? No. Did it cut my arm a little bit? Is it perfect? No. But I can't shit on them for that achievement in the same way that I can't shit on them for the steer by wire achievement, which now I got to beat you up about. So do you trust steer by wire? Mm. Yes. Do I want steer by wire? No. Do I trust that one? Did I initially, and this is a personal opinion, this is, a, a, you know, me personally, did I trust steer by wire initially? No. But I also didn't trust throttle by wire. And I was uh, a, appalled at the idea of brake by wire, which Mercedes and Lexus did in the early 2000s, right? Mercedes had that SBC thing that was fully brake by wire. It sucked. It felt like shit. Lexus did it in the GS and then pulled back on it because it had so many problems. Um, it's not new and I don't like it, but your mach -E is got a Bosch e-booster in it, which means, or i-booster, which means it's brake by wire. And so does my e-golf, same part. Um, and effectively under normal circumstances, it is pulling a request from the pedals travel sensor and but deciding is there which not portion a mechanical goes redundancy in it at all at the floor yeah i don't yeah. think it's fully I, I think there's a mechanical the only reason i trust brake by wire at all is because of the mechanical redundancy that they put in there the problem with the way that system's mechanical redundancy works is you'll never get to it so i the, the e-golf has a problem that i'll say when you first start the car you have about a half a second or a second of no brakes at all while the e-booster, I keep calling it e-booster, but I think Bosch calls it i-booster, while the booster itself builds pressure. And you can stand on that fucking pedal. But so what I do is I you know, hit start, throw it and drive. And while the, while the gauges are doing a little sweep and the thing's booting up and the car moves, the car goes, and I can be standing on that fucking pedal and nothing happens. So even though there is a mechanical, uh, back up at the end of the travel, I can't get, even I can't get to it. I have strong legs. I have to carry around this fucking mouth all the time. So it, yes, it, it effectively though, they're by wire. And in the case of Tesla's steer by wire system, so they worked with NHTSA, they patented the system, and this is all patent documents that I linked to in, the, in this document, but everything is at least double redundant. Most of most everything is triple redundant. And so when, when I say most everything, I mean the critical parts. So the steering sensor has two different, the angle sensors are two completely different sensors that do not talk to each other. Everything is connected three times on three different networks. It's all in the dock, but I mean, they describe the level of redundancy there. And it basically is taking learnings from the airplane 
industry. And Zach, you sort of, I think you gave me a half of a compliment by you're like, well, it's sort of applicable. You use the term like, like kind of sort of applicable to, to planes, which have been fly by wire since 1988. No, it's fully applicable. It's the same <clears throat> shit. But and NHTSA requires that level of redundancy for steer by wire. But what? How Sorry. many uh, steering like motors does it have? So because the so one thing airplanes have, three. it has three. Mo okay. Mo yeah. So it has. So the way this works is there are two independent. So so one of the ways you can do electrically power assisted steering is to have a dual pinion rack. So you have a rack that goes across the front end of the car. Each mm -hmm. end is attached to the wheel so you can move it left and right. You're moving it with a pinion, which is a little shaft that spins from the steering wheel. You can have a dual pinion rack where one of them is attached to your steering wheel and the other one is attached to a motor. And there's a torque sensing device on the steering column that tells you how much torque you're putting in and how much you're turning the wheel. And then the motor is instructed to assist you in your desire. Tesla basically used the idea of the same idea where it has a, the Cybertruck has a dual pinion rack. Both of them are attached to motors. The motors are independently controlled, different computers, different networks, different power supplies, different everything. Um, and there are, triple redundant sensors that are watching what the motors are doing. And the reason you have three of them is if you have a double redundant system and the, the two sensors disagree about something, you don't know which one's right. And right. That's a majority. Scary, right? Yeah. So you have three of them. So one gives a mismatch signal. You disagard that. So they vote. It's two, they out, vote. It's two exactly. out of three. Yeah. Exactly. Wait, wait. So when you say it has three motors, does it have, sorry, does it have three Third motors motor on all rear. doing... For rear okay, steer. so so actually yeah. that's different. So what I was imagining is, you know, triple redundancy is if one of the steering motors fails on the right side of the front pinion, mm -hmm. is there a second motor there on that same right side that takes over? The, in case the of right that side is connected to the left side. So remember that the rack controls both wheels together. They're both rigidly mounted to the same rack. Yeah. Meaning that both motors can control both sides, right? They're right. both, they're he's attached saying, to each other. If one motor fails, the other one can, it can, compensate. can compensate. No problem. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Each one of them is 1.75 kilowatts, I think. They're crazy huge motors, which is only enabled by. 48 volt. So we'll get to that in a second. So but yeah, no, the system is fully, fully redundant. So do I, let me go. Do back I to trust the, it? Do yeah, I want do you, it? Do you That's trust a story? It. Yeah. Cause in that, in, in that, this, uh, when I said, I don't trust it, that mm -hmm. is my opinion. Full yeah. stop. That's my sure. opinion. And I think that a reasonable person would conclude that that is my opinion. I think. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not, but I, but I think I, I do think so. So I'm asking for your opinion on mm -hmm. whether you trust it. I went into it with hesitation, right? As I think we should do skepticism and maybe a little bit of fear. Um, my first demonstration of it was after I had learned for the first real use of it was after I had learned about the redundant. I held the rack in my hand. I saw the way it was done. Did I inspect all the code? Of course not. Um, I, you, no human being could, and Tesla certainly wouldn't release that to me. But after speaking to the engineers who were so concerned with safety that they basically emulated the way airplanes work, I thought, okay, I have some confidence that this could work. Uh, and then I got in the truck and it was so good that I, I, okay, good is a different term. It worked so well as designed that I started testing the system. So I was doing a quick lock to lock to lock to lock to lock as fast as I could. And I was able to get the steering front and rear out of phase with each other where I was slightly ahead because I'd already reached lock and it was still trying to catch up. And then I did the same thing in a Lightning that was there. And I realized that when you have four turns lock to lock, I couldn't fucking turn that steering wheel that fast anyway. So, okay, then I did it repeatedly for 30 seconds straight to see if I could try to overheat the motors, not even close, or no warning, put it that way, no degradation of performance. And then I did genuinely race Randy in the go-kart. So I don't know whether Randy was at going full speed. I doubt very much he could. I don't think he could have caught me when he was in that go-kart because I had to slow the Cybertruck down so much for the corners and then it accelerated so hard. But I genuinely did. 10 tenths as fast as I could around that go-kart track. And I, one of the clips that we have on the, on the GoPro, I was horrified to see was four and a half minutes. So four and a half minutes of limit handling and braking. Brakes never gave out to the point about brakes that you made. Um, the the steering motors never overheated. The truck didn't step, uh, didn't put a, a foot wrong, so to speak. And I didn't even think about the steering. I got out of it going, oh yeah, it did exactly what I wanted it to. So did I approach it? 
apprehensively? Yeah. Do I trust it now? Yeah. Do I think there are going to be failures? Absolutely. This is a new new integration of existing technology. Nothing here is new. Steering angle sensors are not new. Steering motors are not new. They're the same motors, just beefed up a bit, that you use in most electric power steering assist systems. It's the programming. And the bugs are going to be the system detects a fault when it's not there, or some sensor detects something, the computer doesn't know what it is, and it's going to go into like pullover and reboot mode. It's going to happen. But I trust it. I trusted it enough to get in and do a hundred and nothing. Definitely the speed limit on public roads. Um, I trusted it enough to drag race it. I trusted it enough to put Randy Pobst, who is a national fucking treasure, in a car in a cart behind me and not kill him, not run him over. So yeah, I do trust it. Okay. Well, that's that's. I think that's fair. But um, but again, this is this is I trust it, and that's my opinion based on the facts that I saw, and that's that connection between fact and opinion again that I that I, I keep coming back to and fucking sound like I'm being a dick to you, and I'm sorry, but like that's how I see it. Like I saw the facts, I saw the redundancy, I understood that, and then I thought, okay, now let me let me see if I trust it, and then I experienced it in the real world, which again you have not. I have to point out because I'm an asshole, and and then I now I do trust it. The, the other accusation you made about this, which is kind of related, is that I over for that is hold, hold on. So Jason did claim that the Cybertruck is the first production car with steer by wire. That's not true. Infinity had it three years ago. OK, Infinity actually had it 10 years ago. This is called a direct adaptive steer and Infinity Nissan system. Has it been 10 years? Maybe I just. Maybe yeah, it was 2013. Oh, wow. God, 20, time, yeah. Time flies so, when you're fucking carry the weight of world on your shoulders yes. <laughs> when you're aged <laughs> no you know what you know the reason why it seems more recent is we had generation two direct adaptive steering and i think it was the 2016 q50 yeah the um, q50 I think, was the one that i was thinking of yep um and so the that system was unless you love cars Ooh, burn um who wrote, who wrote i fucking that? Alex, Alex Davies for 2014. I hated that system. It was terrible. Um, but to, to, to think, my claim wasn't that it was the first without uh, steer, with steer by wire. My claim was it was the first without a steering column. And that's a, it's a pretty significant difference. Um, then you guys got into a discussion about why get rid of the steering column. And there was some conjecture there about efficiency and there was conjecture about all kinds of other stuff. Let me just clear this out right away. There are very significant benefits and obviously drawbacks to not having a steering column. The ones, the, the biggest ones that come to my mind are cost, right? A steering column costs money. If you don't have to put a part in the car, you save money, ta-da. Second, design and packaging. You can put the steering wheel wherever you want within the car and you don't have to package uh, anything around it. You can just place it wherever you want. Third, the big one for me is safety because you no longer have a harpoon aimed at your heart. But hasn't, uh, that, crash. hasn't that been like... I mean, the collapsible steering collapsible column was invented in what, late 60s. Has that been? They, it they still collapse. Exists, I understand. But it, yeah. I wonder, do we know but, how much impact, no pun intended, that has on crash test dummies or humans when you have a collapsible steering column and an airbag that like softens you as you land? Right. Which would you rather hit, a softened airbag at 5Gs or nothing? Is my question. I mean, what? Well, that's just is my question. Equivalently. Well, well is it if if yeah, well, if you're hitting something that's not being accelerated and propulsed towards your head, right? A steering column, steering wheels bend, steering columns bend, but they have a limitation, right? They have a member in them that's usually something like ten inches or a foot long, um, and that collapses to a certain amount. Once that collapse has already happened, the rest of the steering wheel is hitting you in the fucking face. I, I hear you on this, dude. Totally, every yeah. one of those points about why why steer by wire could be beneficial packaging uh, the lack of a part for cost and the and the lack of a of a column at all i hear you on that my opinion i will, I will mm -hmm. is that me personally fucking pig-headed moron does not believe the trade off is worth it that you could potentially lose steering entirely versus with a with a steering shaft there, and you ha and having a mechanical connection, my opinion is that the the odds of that happening are much much lower. 
The, your opinion is valid. And in fact, that's a, a, a really valid point because what you're looking at in any engineering terms is a trade-off between A and B, right? Uh, the real the real benefit, obviously, of steer by wire isn't the cost and design and packaging and, and safety or even NVH. What it is, is the infinitely adjustable steering ratio, which car companies have been working on for years. BMW had their one Servotron or whatever the fuck that system call, was called. It was terrible. Um, everyone's seemingly tried this. But the benefit is that the inf there is no relationship between the steering wheel and the front wheels other than whatever curve the, the, the engineers program in. And so I don't, I don't as, a, as an enthusiast who likes unassisted steering and, you know, all talkative stuff, I don't particularly care for this. But once you drive a Cybertruck, I think you're going to come around and be like, oh, this is this is fucking really good. I mean, if there's one line in the video that I don't love, every time I hear it, I trip up and say like, oh, fuck, um, I shouldn't have said that, was I was in the car and I said, this is all new, this is all from scratch, and it's all better. Okay, I don't know if the, the exterior of that truck is better, for example. I don't know if stainless steel is a better material. Um, I think the way the car was engineered is a better way of engineering cars, and that was really clever. Um, but, I, but, but the steering is better in a truck, and if it exists without problems, and if no one ever loses steering and dies in the goddamn thing, I hope that's the case. Um, but obviously, people lose steering in regular cars too, right? You can you have knuckles break, you have racks break, shit, tie rods break off, things happen. Um, and so I, I have to be fair and balanced on that. But it's a scary thought, but I don't think it's going to happen. And I would say, in a in a shape of something like the Cybertruck with that vehicle's mission. Overall, it does present a better solution. And I think, in my opinion, the compromise is worth it because of the maneuverability. I genuinely would not have been able to, to drive around that go-kart track at the speed that I did. Um, and that's a stupid stunt, right? Remember 13-year-old no, brain? dude, here. I did in 2007, bro. 07, I raced a smart car on a go-kart track. I remember that. Yeah. It was a it was a goof. I, I it, it was a goof and it was a funny visual and it was a good bit. But the only thing that stands out to me about the production of that video was the hand over 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 hand to the point where I couldn't feel my arms anymore after like, I, this is a, <laughs> and we're talking about a smart car. Well, okay, right, question yeah. Jason, did you do anything normal because the go-kart stunt was was fun and whatnot, but obviously it's not a real test of how people use pickup right. trucks. Right. Uh, I'm not trying to shit on your video. Um, valid. No, no, no. It's valid. 100% valid. So did, but did you do any normal stuff with the truck? Did you drive it around the parking lot? Did you parallel park it? Like, I'm curious what the learning oh, yeah. curve was. Like, does the sen does the sensitivity and, you know, the rack change, like, every two miles per hour speed, every five? Mm -hmm. how, like, how did that work? Yep. Perfectly valid question. First of all, let me admit that's a dumb stunt, but there's intelligence behind that dumb stunt because when I'm looking at a visual medium like video, right, we have sight, sound, and motion, and I want to take advantage of all of those things rather than saying to you, like we're doing in a podcast right now, this is good, this is bad, this is what it is, right? I always want to show it. And the best way that I could show the maneuverability of a truck uh, is to do that. What I think was missing from that segment was me doing the same thing in a lightning, which would have required 75 point turns. And I said in the video, stupidly, I fucked up. I would have been a sweaty mess. We should have just fucking filmed me doing it because it wouldn't have, wouldn't have genuinely wouldn't have worked. So that stunt was there to show the maneuverability, not just as a stunt. It was just a, a device. No, no, I know that. You're, like, you're, Thank you for yeah. explaining video production to me. That feels good. Uh, <laughs> no, it's up to you. No, no, no. No, no, no. no. I'm, I'm not trying to insult six, you. Six I'm trying to defend myself. Of, of a TV I, show listen, I'm not but. trying to defend myself from you. First of all, I just want the audience to understand that, right? <clears throat> when I do these stunts, it's because it's a, it's a way. And, I, you know, there you make a valid point, right? That's not a real world case. No, right? I'm asking that you, like, I'm not happened. trying to argue with you about Steer by Wire. I'm asking yeah. a genuine question. Curious question because I haven't it's a truck. perfectly like, valid how did question. how did it yeah. operate in parallel parking situations or other parking situations? What he's saying I is how do you know them. how yeah. much steering to input when the ratio is very constantly variable like that? Oh, and what was yes. that learning curve? Yeah. It was there were two of them. Dun, 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 because uh, because this thing is software based, they can change anything they want. The first one that I drove was in Fremont in a different truck. 
uh, in a in Fremont's uh, factory is a parking lot in the back that they set up with a cone course on it, a parallel parking course, and then they let me drive it out on their test track. Uh, at that point, I wasn't allowed to drive it on the road um, without engineers and blah, 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 whatever. Um, so I got in the car and I immediately, I had the, the first time I ever sat in that Cybertruck, I was to back out of a parking spot and make a uh, 180 degree U-turn in the back. And this is now... I don't often get that overwhelmed, but this is sensory overload because there's no rear view mirror. There's a camera instead. You can't see a fucking thing out the back corners until you know where to look with on the display. And now I turn the wheel and it goes boom and stops right there. And I'm like, whoa, hold on. Oh, okay, hold on. It was totally disorienting. Um, once I started moving, it was fine, but it was too gainy. I didn't like it. It was every time I tried to make it low speed, every time I tried to make a move, it was like, I don't, I don't, I don't trust where it's going to go. And then even on the track, like I didn't hit a cone on the slalom, but when I got it on the track, I was doing like 70 miles an hour. And I was afraid they had like a high speed emergency uh, lane change maneuver. That's genuinely scared the shit out of me. And if I can fault Tesla for one thing on this day, it was don't put someone in a car like this for the first time in their life and have them do a fucking emergency lane change thing with Jersey barriers on either side. But to my surprise, I was fine. I slid right through there, right through and I was fine, but it did, it was disorienting. The second truck that I had, had, had just gotten a software update based on the feedback that they got from me. And I think I was the first person outside of Tesla to drive that this year by wire, first person out, outside of the development team. And I said, it's way too gainy. Like this is disorienting. The second one took me 30 seconds. I was like, oh, okay, good. And that was only at like genuinely maneuvering speeds. Once I was moving, somehow, whoever was doing the research on what the, what the ratios should have been and what the change is, it just felt 100% natural. Um, so, you know, the first time you, you move, you're fine, but it, this just becomes, it does, it went where I want. And, and that was another good benefit of that go-kart scene because that was one of the first things we did. We did the quarter mile first when we were filming, then we did the go-kart stuff. And I didn't even think about the series, but genuinely didn't even think about it. And I realized afterwards, oh, wow, hold on. It just did, it went, I did it. it did. Oh. Huh, who knew it works? So I hope that answers your question. But I did parallel mm -hmm. park. I did the road afterwards and just kind of the normal. And then I get back in a regular car and I'm like, this is fucking dumb. I mean, you know, and then you get back in the Cybertruck and you're like, oh, shit. Okay, hold on. Recalibrate. Done. Yeah, I think it, it does actually like work. I think it'll just be a learned skill for anyone who drives it now. That's why I was curious what the learning curve was like or how twitchy the, it yeah. was or whatever. Yeah, if they get the programming right, and I think there's still a little bit of room for improvement and they're still working on it. But if they get the programming right, uh, it will be natural. And I also think, as I said to them, they need to put a slider in where you can decide how much speed ramp you want. And don't. You choose it. There's no connection. They can do anything mm -hmm. they want. Um, how come and, the trunk's so small if they don't have a steering column then? What the hell? Is that, that's that's a big, a there's question. a big motor up there with a locking diff. Um, and look at the shape of it. I mean, the, the, the shape of this thing dictated everything else. And that was the first thing we saw. That's why I brought the DeLorean, which you guys kind of True, brought up, but, but you know, it was the DeLorean's really compromised because it was supposed to be a mid engine car and wound up being a rear engine car. It was supposed to have a tiny little rotary and a big fat 90 degree V6. Um, and the same thing here, it was supposed to be here, look at it. And now they have to fucking engineer the thing with crumple zones, with crash safety, with wipers, with all the rest of this stuff. And I think that just dictates the size of the front. Mm. You know, look, do, do I think it's as usable as a as a Rivian R1T? Sure. In some ways, it's far more usable. In some ways, it's far less usable. But I think that compromise of which one works for you goes to the potential buyers. Let them well, decide. Objection. That's opinion. But uh, I'm just fucking with you. I, I agree. I, with said, I think People, like <laughs> arguing which one is more usable. I think is a fool's errand because cars are subjective. Of course, the only time everyone's use case is different, right? Right. Everyone's use case is different. I think what, and then what gets dangerous is when we start going, this is a better truck overall statement, or this is superior to like, you know, you pointed out that it has the 240 volt in the bed and, and thing. I mm -hmm. think that invention from all the truck manufacturers is such a great thing. The Ford power boost we had the, was the awesome. Thing. Let's see if it does it. Yeah. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, that's, oh, that's my why, that's, that's my reaction to, to it. Oh. No, I, I think it's awesome. And, and is that a phone thing? How no, do you do it's that? a, it's a oh, Mac OS. Yeah, new OS. Oh, really? I'm on my lap. 
But if I do this, hold is on. that why you it see, did the thumbs up thing before? Yeah, oh, that's before, I before I was like, it's oh, yeah. weird. Yeah, Matt looked at me and I said, I didn't do that. Oh, uh, yeah, fucking no, sometimes, it's bizarre, right? sometimes Apple just puts garbage. My favorite one is this one. Like, hold on, wait, wait, wait. Oh. A balloon. They gotta spend the money, or they won't. What if have you, to pay taxes. What if you do like the blood? That's a great <laughs> you know, question. If you do, if you do West Side, does it like does it do gang signs? How does no. it? Doing? I'm looking, no, I'm no. looking. I've done some pretty. Prof- I flashed myself at it. Can you make it, one it, draw no. a dick no. somehow? Like, yeah, there, that's what you I make, <laughs> If you hold up an eggplant or something, like, how do we make? I, you know, I was like thinking, V-dub in the house. Yeah. It doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, okay, sorry. all right. So I. I I I retain my uh, position that I that I don't necessarily trust it for the reasons that I stated before, but I will accept Fair. your explanation for how it works based on the fact that you actually use the fucking thing. Thank you. Um, and you wanted to talk about forty eight volt. Yeah. So you're, I think the ac- actual accusation is that I under I overplayed the importance of forty eight volt. And I'm going to refute that. I think you said, well, didn't you? Uh, I, I I think, uh, well, you probably have exactly what I said written down. Oh, wait, um, it's but, in the PDF. Yeah. yeah. Which we were only sent one moment, one minute before we started the show. I know, because I didn't want to. Man's I, watched I, a lot of fucking Law and Order. He really knows how to get that I evidence in. I have a law degree. Fucking... I have a law degree. Listen, okay, look. Quote, he downplayed the role that 48 mild hybrids have had for the last three years. Um, okay. I think that is the Here, quote, yes. That is the quote. <laughs> Ta-da. Here's what happened. I think you both confused the operating voltage of a propulsion system, propulsion system with the bus voltage of the rest of the car. So let me explain. EVs operate at 380, 402, 420, 500, 800 volts, right? That is the propulsion system. And the reason that they operate at high voltage is because power need, your power output is the, the not some, the product multiplied of voltage times current. So if you have a lot of voltage, you can reduce current. You double voltage, you, you have current. Ha- current, as we asked Jason to explain, Jason Fenske to explain in the video, is expensive because current requires wires, which requires copper, and copper is really expensive. So taking the propulsion system's voltage on those mild hybrids from 12 to 48 quartered the amount of copper effectively, or near as makes no difference, or rounded somewhere in there, effectively quarters, it, it quarters the current requirements, which then divides the n- number of copper in by about four, one four. Um, that is not the same thing as the bus system, right? It's, so the propulsion system on the e, on, on your EV is, I think the Ford's is 480 volts, I don't remember. Um, but the bus for the low voltage system on the car is 12. And that means your headlights, your taillights, your airbags, your seatbelt buckles, your seatbelt retractors, your electric power steering motor, your AC compressor on that I think uses the high, high voltage side. But the fan for your HVAC, your wipers, all of those ancillary devices operate on 12 volts. And so that's, that has nothing to do with the 400 volts under the hood and the 48 volt micro hybrid system in another car. Those are completely separate. But the reason to go from 12 to 48 is the same reason that micro hybrids went from 12 to 48, which is that you can s- send a lot more power over those wires with a lot less wire. And so the aggregate benefit to Tesla by removing all of those 12 volt system and replacing with 48 is all smaller componentry, a quarter as much copper, and da, 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 and the benefits start trickling down, right? For They weren't able to, I, I, I don't believe, and this is opinion, that they would have been able to properly use steer by wire without going to 48 volts because of the huge power needs that you need. You need about 300 amps if you were doing that on 12 volts, so you need a wire this thick to do that. That's just a waste of copper. So by my calculations, Oh, um, oh, hold on, sorry. And the other thing is when you're talking about uh, electrical losses, there are two formulas that you guys need. Oh my God, it's doing the bubbles thing again. Sorry. Because if it sees your thumb, um, it bubbles. The right. thumb is the bubble? The bu- the yeah, the thumb is the bubble. So line loss equals I squared R, right? So the amount of losses in a wire is the square of current times resistance. When you multiply the voltage by four, you divide the current by four, so you're using as a quarter of current, which means the losses go down to one sixteenth of what they were. They're divided by 16. 
And so when you're an electric vehicle and you're looking for eliminating as many losses as you can because efficiency is king, mm -hmm. that's a huge, huge benefit. And we're not talking about the propulsion system uh, here, losses. The propulsion system in this truck operates at 800. That, and for that exact reason, right? But the regular things don't need to operate at 800 and you don't want 800 volts in the fucking cabin with you because you drop your soda and you're <laughs> getting zapped. Yeah. But 48 is still safe to touch. So it's- Is this some of why um, Lucid's uh, cars are so efficient is like shrinking componentry. And like one of the reasons their range got so good is because they were so much more efficient at just getting the energy from the battery to the motors, correct? That's Lucid's all high voltage type. volt, isn't it? Yeah, there's yeah. some eight it, something. Lucid, but but remember Lucid that there's an H advertising 900 volt. Yeah. There, there's an HV system, high voltage system in the car. Those wires are all orange. They have to be by law. And then there's the LV, the low voltage side. Lucid still uses 12 volt. And the reason why Lucid uses 12 volt is because the industry's standard since 1955 has been 12 volt. Well, and I imagine a lot of the suppliers so for those accessories are also ro rocking 12 volt stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Every, everything is 12 volts. So Tesla yeah. had to push back on the suppliers. So that PDF that they sent me, which they really did send me, and they really did send to Farley and every other CEO of every other car company on how to engineer a 48 volt system, actually, and I hope I'm not violating the NDA that I signed on this one, actually gives a list of parts that Tesla pushed the, develop, uh, the development of at suppliers and said, here are these parts that are already, uh, we've made available to all of you to buy that run on 48 volts. And it was a bunch of computers and a bunch of switches and stuff. I think the Cybertruck seat motors are still 12 volts um, because it, they, didn't, they didn't have time to engineer 48 volt seat motors. So those will come next. But the, the benefit to the whole car is efficiency as the whole. And if my calculation is correct, the average, from what I found online, the average car uses 40 pounds of copper in the non-propulsion system. So that's just for devices like EVs are a different story because that's obviously all that copper. But internal combustion engines, cars typically use um, 40 pounds. If you can eliminate three quarters of that, you're saving 30 pounds of copper. Um, and that's at current wholesale mass market copper prices. That's 130 bucks. So and has remember the resistance that to this change been, have other companies wanted to do this and suppliers said, look, we already have the tooling. We work in 12 volt. It's the most common system. And this is just now, you know, Tesla has to kick the door open and say, well, we chicken need and this egg. for yeah. our shit. Okay. Yeah, it was chicken and egg. I mean, I remember reading in the 1990s that GM was, I think it was GM was really pushing hard to move to 48 volt. Um, and it was for this reason. It's cost saving per car. It's wire. And, you know, remember that you save 30 pounds per car. That doesn't sound like much. No, but it's a you lot. start saving and $130 parts here, right? a car is a lot too. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. Remember that like Mercedes will put red turn signals in their fucking S class to save 13 cents a car versus amber ones, right? Yeah. So 130 bucks is massive in terms of engineering car and 30 pounds could be the difference between one EPA rating and the next one, which could result in cafe fuel economy penalties, which re could re result in three more grams per CO2 of carbon dioxide that's going to get them some horrible tax in Germany or something. So these are real significant gains. And and so I, you're totally right that I, un that I downplayed the 48 volt mild hybrids. But those 48 volt mild hybrids already did exactly what this is doing on the propulsion side. But EV went way past 48 and went to 400 or Got 900 it. or 800 so, or 1,000. Okay. So, noted, um, noted, corrected. I appreciate the explanation. Now I'm going to give you a, a bone. You said, he straight face said that the Model S got 5.4 out of five stars in crash testing. NHTSA immediately disputed that and said there was no such thing as a 5.4. And we have You're, the story for that. You are correct. And we have up. Tesla's explanation. Also. You are absolutely correct. And He's I setting but us I, up. I don't trust this. I don't trust this. Don't trust I, me. I don't, don't trust me. I don't. No, no. I, it's not that I don't want you to trust me. Let me, I think you, your point You're is both, correct. You're both right. Like, I mean, this is, well, it's a say. Me, no, 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 there is no such thing. There is, right. Matt, there is, you know, or Zach, both of you guys, there is no such thing as a 5.4 star rating. But I chose to include that, and let me defend myself on why I chose to include that, and I think you guys will understand why I did. If we go back and look at what actually happened, Tesla puts a press release out saying, NHTSA does not, they said this in their press release, NHTSA, not National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, does not publish a star rating above five. Mm -hmm. They said that. 
However, and this is where they got themselves into trouble, safety levels better than five are captured in the overall vehicle safety store, score, which is called VSS, that is provided to the manufacturers where the Model S achieved a new combined record of 5.4 stars. It did not receive the 5.4 stars. It received a VSS of 5.4, which was, as is confirmed in my little document by a statement from NHTSA and the, the head of automotive safety, was actually a new record, a new record VSS of 5.4. So let's back up for a second. When an agency, so crash test ratings change over time, right? They're graded on a curve so that, because you know what's gonna happen within a year or two, everyone's gonna be engineering towards a five-star rating. And then it does the consumer no good to have only five stars. The star rating, is a very low resolution rating. You have one, two, three, four, or five. Five data points, that's that's it. It's all you, your choices, no decimals, no nothing. And you have to imagine that the people who designed the system made the five star mark either unattainable or something to reach towards, right? That's That's the goal. This is the best we think anyone can do given current standards. Tesla scored on that test of VSS, which is what, what uh, the star rating is based on, they scored a 5.4. And I think what the press release was trying to accomplish, my thought, my conjecture, was to say other cars have hit a 5.0, but we want to find a way to differentiate ourselves. And in fact, we also want to point out that the system is broken. If the, the target, the best possible was 5.0 and we hit 5.4 on that scale, you need you need to rescale this so that we get a five o or five star rating and other companies get a four because otherwise the the consumer can't differentiate between a Volvo five star and a Tesla five star when maybe that Volvo only scored four point seven right and so, more specifically the math uh, Tesla spokesman explained that NHTSA presently defines five stars as a ten percent or less risk of injury from combined and weighted crash scores. The Tesla Model S had a roughly seven percent risk of injury using the same calculations. So that that's the math behind the math. Yeah, they so Tesla went a little bit far in their press release by saying we earned five point four stars. They didn't. They earned five stars, but on the test they earned five point four out of what was thought where 5.0 would have been the maximum rating because the people who wrote it must have assumed that a 10% chance of injury or less is the maximum attainable value. And so, and by the way, I think it's also worth, worth mentioning that NHTSA has since been talking about, um, uh, about allowing decimal points because I think the, a resolution of a one, two, three, four, five stars. So when NHTSA wrote their press release refuting Tesla's 5.4 star, they weren't refuting the performance. What they were saying is, our guidelines say you can only communicate this in whole integers from one to five. So I'm thinking about, right, I was there for crash test, which was fucking amazing because I wanted to be a crash test engineer you know, when I was in college. I was in college for mechanical engineering. And I'm watching the whole thing and I'm saying, I'm writing the script and I'm trying to build an argument that Tesla has a history of just breaking tests in crash safety, right? They physically broke the roof crush strength test machine because the Model S was too strong and it couldn't handle it. They broke the rating system because the 5.0 was supposed to be the no chance of achieving this and they got significantly better than that. How do I build an argument about that? And so I did blindly repeat Tesla's claim that it earned 5.4 stars when maybe I should have phrased it differently that Tesla, you know, that NHTSA thought this was not possible and they exceeded the possible. But I only got 28 minutes. And I needed to get through that segment really quick to say, hold on, this company's test record is breaking the test. And so did I overreach? Yeah, a little bit. Valid point. And valid point to call me on now. God damn it with the fucking thumbs up. Valid, valid to call me on that and say, hey, what the fuck are you doing? But the, the thumbs, reason I'm thumbs up thing is just it's I love showing it. up on my I love it, Tim much. Cook. I it's love it. Too um, fucking much. It's we gotta so find funny. a way to turn this setting off. There's gotta be a way to turn it off. But yeah, exactly. he, what I want is profane the upgrade, shit. The upgraded call in document. We need to have a how yeah. to setting. I'll, I'll make another. That's, a, that's on iOS, thing. man. That's on I know. His thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, we need to give the instructions. Yeah. Well, I think. Look, you bring up a good point that we probably have more cars today than have in the past have had five star ratings. You know, if cars are continually yeah. get safer, I'm, I'm trying to find a, a total list, and I, you know, everyone just has the top ten. You're, but there's you're, a lot yeah. of definitely. Them. You're right. So, you're right that it's it's too low resolution. I I I agree with that argument. We should either have it out of a hundred, you know, or have it have it out of something that allows for more differentiation because there are so many cars that get. Five. five and some stars, of the some yeah. of the scores are just like 
not acceptable, acceptable and good. I mean, right. some of it, it's like, is that's that IHS, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's that's pretty shitty given the volume of data that these crash test agencies have. And the importance. But it's quickly yeah. Right, the importance of crash results. That's right. the thing is, you're talking life or actual death here. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You know, no, I'm totally with you. I think I think what needs to happen is what Euro NCAP does, which is they're constantly changing the bogey, right? If everyone starts getting four and five stars, they reduce it. And I think, Frank, personally, I think it should be a standard deviation curve that looks like the IQ curve. The average rating is two and a half stars. And if, you know, and there's X amount of standard deviations above and below. And the second somebody hits five stars, that's reduced to a 4.5 on a curve. So that the, some, if, if somebody beats it, they get five. But that, how, how the do fuck they, do you communicate that on a you know moving target to a consumer? I was gonna. That's who the doesn't question. Not yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's so. Uh, this is a great debate, and it's a really, really good point that you guys brought up. But I just didn't know another way to communicate it without. Okay. To your friends, parroting what Tesla said, which was correct in the in the spirit, if not the. Uh, and not the actual words. And it kind of and it and and look, it it does sort of go back to, you know, the the company does have a habit, despite their very good engineering and despite their very good this, they still have a habit of over of over promising and over and exaggerating. And you can call it marketing, you can you can call it Elon not shutting the fuck up. You can call it whatever whatever you want to call it, puffery. You know, I've, right. my fucking favorite word, puffery. You can call puffery. it any of that shit. But I just I also think that there are other companies and imperfect ones, uh, imperfect uh, imperfect as they may be, that underpromise and over deliver. And I like that personally a lot better. Yeah, I like companies that underpromise and overdeliver. I will say that in the defense of the the truth, I wonder if it's Tesla that overpromises and underdeliver, or if it's just fucking Elon. You know what? Mm. Uh, 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 totally valid point. But yeah. again, I don't know. You cannot I don't know. separate them when it comes Sadly. to yeah, right. the company's marketing. They have no PR department. Every no. fucking every you know headline from anywhere from Wired to the New York Times to the fucking L.A. Times or whatever is Elon Musk's Tesla says this yeah. when reached for comment. Elon Musk says this. Elon Musk fucking tweeted about this, and so we're going off what we got here. You know, know, that's that's, know, it's that's what they're feeding us. And so how, how um, you know, and I and I I respect your efforts to ch try and pull it apart. But we're so bombarded with Elon says this. Elon says that. And he's so full of shit. So often it must be brutal to work for this fucking guy. Um, I I having had experience in speaking to a number of people that work for that company. It's a roller coaster is how they all describe it. Right. You are. From what it seems like, you know, you're subject to his whims, but I, I, as a, as a, I'm not going to judge him as a person because I don't know him. I will say that he's making it increasingly difficult for me as a person to like him as a person based on some of the things he's saying. What I really appreciate is what he's done for the industry. Like the idea that he caused or Tesla as an organization caused the engineers to write a cunty document to send to everyone is like, we did fucking homework for you. So I don't know if you guys freeze frame that video, point in the video, but I made, made a fake binder because I was under the NDA and I'm not allowed to share that PDF or I would have. Um, but I said the, you know, the white binder says how to, how to uh, engineer a 48 volt vehicle. And then underneath it is like, did I really need to do your fucking homework for you guys? You incompetent boobs love XOXO Elon. Right. And I sort of wrote that in there as a joke because that's what's happening. But to your point, actually, and I'm gonna, I'll make a point against myself, I fell into the same trap and probably shouldn't have said, Elon did this, Elon did that. I should have just said Tesla. But you're right, they're, they're, the story behind why the Cybertruck exists apparently started because Elon's kid asked him, why does the future not look like the future and blah, 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 and shit. So I fell into the same trap. Maybe the funny next thing time is, I review- The such an Tesla easy product. answer to that question. Why doesn't the future look like the future? Well, because movie props don't fucking, don't have to do anything besides look good on camera. Um, but and, a million fucking people, Matt, 
A million well, people wait. put a deposit down. Do we on think? It. You know, do you think that this looks like a futuristic vehicle, or do you think it looks like what the futuristic vehicles were in movies that were in the '80s? So it's it's grabbing our nostalgia as you know, thirty yeah. to fifty year old people. I mean, clearly Elon has seen four movies. Did you Space just Balls, fucking call me 50? Total Recall. <laughs> no, I know our de- I know our demo data on our on YouTube. That's um, why. Okay. Oh, thank God. I was like, I will fuck. I know that I got the grays, but I will. F- Fuck you. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, no. I, <laughs> I, I, a million I people. <laughs> look, I, 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 I know the statistic of how many people put down the hundred dollar deposit. And on the one hand, point a million people. On the other hand, the amount of money was so low, mm-hmm. prohibitively expensive to so few people. Yeah. Uh, the premise back then, four years ago, was so ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's let's go back to 2019, right? That it, it it I wonder, and I will put myself out there for potentially being very wrong, depending on how many people end up taking buying this thing, and the and and the uh, the premise of it by fucking the man himself was so far out there. That I think there's a million people who'd go fuck it, hundred bucks at the wall. Let's see what happens, you know. And I and I wonder. It's not like, um, uh, and I'll, and look, they'll probably sell as many as they can build because they won't be able to build. It'll take them two decades to build a million of these things. But <laughs> you know what I mean. But and I think you probably would agree with me on that. But I but, I think the ramp up is going to be a lot slower than people think it is. Right, right. Um, so, but it, but the but the the hundred dollar deposit. And the, is is it's such a small amount of money to such a percentage yeah. of the population that mm-hmm. I don't think it accurately represents truly Sales. intentioned buyers. I fully agree with that. I fully agree with that. Uh, I so I did a podcast yesterday with a sort of Tesla guy, um, and he I, I think it, a couple times he was trying to get me to predict sales volumes of the car what, and that it was going to be a huge massive hit. I won't because I I frankly don't fucking know. Um, I have no idea. I didn't put a deposit on one. I don't want one. But the one thing I will say is, if your job is to create attention onto your brand, if one of Elon's jobs probably is. And you get a million people to plunk down deposits. And then your non-existent PR team can give three people access to a truck and get 60 million combined views. I mean, Mark has got fucking 18 million views in, in two weeks on his on his video of this. You have one. Like you're, the fact that you and I are talking about this, the fact that four and a half million people watch my stupid ass video, like it's unbelievable how much attention this thing got. So do yeah. I know whether it's going to sell or not? No, but it certainly got the attention of the world. Well, well it's, it's voyeuristic for sure. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. voyeuristic, but the absolutely. fact, I think that, I think the fact that you brought out an LM002 and a DeLorean, <laughs> both of which are cars that get lots of attention. But yeah. if you ask how many people actually want to drive these fucking things around, the answer is this is much, well, much, much lower. Funny enough, in the document, you said you think they made 600 LMs. They made 301 of them. No, it's, and, I was high. I was, I was no, high you were high, that. right? That's a really – so you made a good point, right? So the reason I bought the DeLorean, and obviously, is for four reasons. Number one, it's the only ever other production stainless steel bodied car ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it took four years. It was twice the price it was supposed to be, and it had to be engineered from the outside in. Worked the reason out I brought really the well for the, that company too. Worked the whole yeah. all of those decisions worked out. Hold super on, let me see if I can get well. Apple to do super fucking well for Delorean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fucked Delorean up, and now and Alec Baldwin Lamborghini. with huge eyebrows is <laughs> in twins. <laughs> I think, but the, and then the LM was a really interesting one because it's another sixty-eight hundred pound four door pickup truck that was the fastest truck ever made, and I thought that was really interesting. And then I read that Crane Driver looking, article on it. Great looking truck. Oh, it's one of my favorite great. vehicles in the one world of the, ever, One period. of the biggest shit boxes of all time that just is oozes fucking silliness. I want one. Of I want course one. you do, but because it, it's it's too of stupid course it's awesome. to be rational. You yeah, know? but that was, when I read that car and driver review, I'm like, oh my God, I literally could put it in Word, do a find and replace, and replace every mention of Lamborghini LM02 with Tesla Cybertruck, and it all fucking holds true, except for some of the specs. Like, this is unbelievable. But I mean, so we had the Cybertruck at a hotel overnight 
uh, between the first night, first day of filming, which is dynamic, and the second day, which was static. And uh, I had it parked in the in the garage or in the parking lot in this little tiny hotel, like you know, in like an industrial park in nowhere. And I get up to pee at four o'clock in the morning, three or four o'clock in the morning, and I well, I'm like, what is that crowd outside? And there's a fucking crowd in the middle of the night around that Cybertruck. It got more attention than every other vehicle I've ever been in combined. I understand so, that, but that you know as well as I do that once these things become commonplace on the street, that won't happen yeah. anymore. I know, I mean, but I'm just curious of whether that will translate into sales or not. I don't know, which is what makes this whole thing fascinating. I have no idea. Well, the attention is amazing because if people, if people want to buy it, they're so psyched to see it in, in the flesh now. And if they hate right. it, they want to go watch the videos to see if you or the other How people that reviewed it, it yeah. say anything bad about it. And then there's the p curious people in the middle. So it's the perfect storm yeah. for huge views and attention. And Did I don't you, know whether that'll translate sorry. into sales. I don't. Sorry. I I mean, I yeah. And also, you know, on top of in terms of sales, the, the, the price is a lot higher. As you as you did point out, the price is a lot higher in the video and in the production car than was promised. Shocking. The range is lower uh, than was promised. Also shocking. The that a battery extender in the bed thing is fucking shameful um but uh but I think it's genius Sorry. You, you really oh yeah oh yeah you know that people are gonna go for that they're gonna eat that shit up you I can guess, bolt in another battery i mean i guess i guess to someone buying this having a useful truck bed is fucking a waste of space anyway they might yeah, as well I have, have you bed. guys you guys criticized the bed length and compared it to a Hyundai Santa Fe or Santa Cruz, sorry, Zach. Oh, yeah, no, the bed's actually big. The thing, the thing about the truck is that oh god, I'm not, sorry, that the truck is actually friggin' usable, which is the annoying part of the whole thing. Okay, now this is Jason, the person talking, who thought, and I said it in the video, and I meant it. I thought it was a bad joke. I genuinely did. And then I get in, and I'm like, the bed is bigger, is wider than an F one hundred and fifty s. It's six feet long, but you know, you don't you don't have to worry about that, which is halfway between the the small and medium beds on F one hundred and fifty, which are six, uh, five and a half, and six and a half. Um, but you can fit a sheet of plywood down down flat on it. I'm like, this is like, and it holds twenty five hundred pounds. What other truck does that? Like, this is insane. It actually has that substance behind behind the engine and, and substance of engineering behind it. Like it does the pickup truck thing. I thought people were going to buy it because it's a styling statement, but lo and behold, it actually does that. Is so, it, is the bed six by four uh, at the top? Cause it, it tapers slightly it taper as it goes in, in, in yeah? the bottom. I didn't measure it. And so uh, to, to address another really valid, did, it did, did it, it did taper, right? The photos show a taper. I don't maybe, maybe you didn't measure it. I but think the, the base of it, it. I think the base of it. Yeah. The top is 51 and the base is 48. So I was told, and I did not try this, because it's strictly a matter of time, I did not put a piece of plywood or drywall in it, but I was told that it does fit. If it doesn't, well, then they really fucked up. Uh, it's, I mean, because that's sort of the, the base measure of a pickup truck. Um, but it did fit that go-kart in like no problem. The, the thing closed, it's, it's a big bed. Is it, um, is it six by four with tailgate open or tailgate closed? I'm trying to find the closed. specs, but there's- Oh, okay. Uh, I have them, it's, it's on the PDF, I'm sorry. <laughs> Send it to us um, before we start the show, man. I was, you know, you I didn't. It wasn't fuck. done. Did I am a sneaky fuck. You uh, say it wasn't yeah. done. You had it printed. It wasn't already. done. You really think it was done. I, I'm not kidding. I printed it ten minutes before because I needed the printer to turn off after it does its cooldown cycle, so I didn't have that in the back, uh, in the background noise. Hold on. Did hold on, you hold on, actually on. cut your clothing yeah. and or person on it? Yes. Uh, by the way, it is. Six foot long by 51 inches wide is the official measurement. Um, but I was able to find something that said it was 48. So I think it's 48 at the base, I 51 if that's at the top. top and bottom. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, I did. I was walking by. So this, the scene where it looks fake, where there's, there is a fake sound effect of, of my, my yeah. sleeve ripping. Um, the next thing I said was, ow, fuck. And we cut out the fuck because, you know, we're a wholesome uh, program. But that was real. That I was just walking by and it looks fake. And I, I'm annoyed by that. But it did. I mean, it's just a little bit of a tiny cut. I think you probably see it here. It wasn't, it wasn't like, it didn't gash me. But then it did cut Anthony's jacket open. And we just were laughing about this. So, you know. Do I think it's gonna it's gonna kill anyone because of we're gonna talk about pedestrian impact? I don't think do I think it's gonna kill anyone because of it? No. Should it probably be sharp enough to cut people? Well, I've cut myself on other things. I sliced my finger open on the inside of a door panel on a Chevy once. 
I stupid. Think I think they'll, the, the I nose, think they'll fix the that nose, for production. The, a sharp nose of a of a truck is bad. I think that's bad. Yep. And for Did the record, s- I think a lot of huge SUVs that are, have huge hood heights and all that kind of shit, I think all that's bad too. Okay. I agree. Jason, As a personal yourself- matter of opinion, I, I totally agree. Yeah, Zach? What, what part of the truck, I, I don't remember in the video, what part of the truck did you cut yourself it was off? Is it a corner the, where two panels meet? It was or? The corner where the hood meets the fender, and I do not remember which okay. part. I think the part that actually was the sharpest was the fender. The front top of the fender, no. right? The pointed yeah, part. Yeah, I think that's what it yeah. was, yeah. Yeah, you can, you can just, you can see that by looking at photos that like the panel gap's not great and it's a fucking thing. And it may, it's My bigger right concern. back to, um, you've read Unsafe at Any Speed, right? Yeah. yeah. So do you remember when Nader in Unsafe at Any Speed is talking about the tail fins of, uh, of El Dorado's and why we mm-hmm. don't have tail fins anymore because of the little yeah. kid who went to go catch a football and Im- was <laughs> impaled by the tail fin of an yeah. El Dorado? And, uh, and that's why we don't have those kinds of things anymore. Yeah. I mean, look, to be honest, I'm more concerned with people losing their fingers in the doors, right? So they're, so, they're soft closed doors. Um, so, you know, they have actuators to push themselves open and they can break up to an inch of ice or whatever, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But my concern is if you get your, your finger stuck in between the door and the, and the motor strong enough, it might just guillotine your finger. Um, I don't think, I hope There's got to be a torque sensing override, right? I hope so. But, you know, I'm not concerned about a little cut. You learn to avoid that. I'm more concerned about losing a digit. And Well, you, you don't know, learn to avoid it if you're a pedestrian who doesn't own and live with the truck every day. Yeah, but, but I don't think that's going to kill it. Like, I don't think that's going to slice. The pedestrian impacting is a really good conversation. So let's let's talk about that. So you rightfully pointed out that tall, vertically vertical front, blunt-nosed vehicles are very, very dangerous for pedestrian crash yes. impacts. You, that is correct. That is that is not up for debate. That's that's a, a fact. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I will say is the reason I did that stand up where I had the Cybertruck together with a Lightning and then the Hummer was in the background was to show the height difference because oh I think the Hummer's probably worse. I think the Hummer's probably worse. So much worse. But yeah, yeah. And I wish I would have measured it. But if you guys go look and it, it, this the freeze frame, I'm sorry to say, is in the fucking document. So I'm, I can show you guys there. But more importantly, the um, it was the the verge. It was. Yeah. The verge reported on the IIHS. So last month, IIHS, which is the Insurance Institute for Crash Safety, which is probably the, the toughest organization of crashes to pass, um, did finally publish a study on the relationship between hood heights uh, and pedestrian injuries. Yeah, and, it's not good. Um, it's not good at all. But one of the important things to look at was this last chart, which hopefully you guys can see, yep. which is talking, this is backwards, it's hard for me to do this. Yeah, no, but we, can, we can, yeah, hold so, it right there. That's exactly right. the perfect spot. So what you're talking about is 40%, 40 inch versus the you know medium height, which is mm-hmm. 30 and then under, under. Uh, but if you look at the, the, the tall one, look I at the it. difference between, Oh, oh, thank Zach. You. Yeah, there we go. Ah, Zach, you're you're. Uh, he's very a fast. This one. Yes, he's like unbelievable. So the what the the point was though that tall and blunt actually doesn't perform any worse than tall and sloped. Um, the real risk factor seems to be far more than anything else height. Mm. And so the Cybertruck, I should have measured it, uh, but I just didn't have a chance. The the front end is so much lower than we thought it was based on the on the pictures, or that uh, I shouldn't say than we than I thought that I had to put those things there. I mean, the F one fifty's got to be at least six inches taller, and the Hummer's probably six inches taller than that. So it's it is a fair criticism of all of the SUVs and a fair criticism of the U.S. government's uh, lack of pedestrian crash safety regulation, like yeah. Europe has. But the reason I said I don't want to get hit by any one of these because I don't think we can look as as non-engineers without a, the ability to test it. I don't think we can look at the front ends of these trucks and decide that the HFS, that hard fucking steel, is any more dangerous than, for example, one of the things you pointed out, which is that the grills on traditional pickup trucks are soft plastic. Because right behind and the, that and soft the hoods plastic are, is and hard the hoods steel. are aluminum on all the other ones, right. too. 
So, but right behind that is a cross member and a bumper bar. And I, I I'm with you and I'm not arguing there, but I'm not, I'm not in a position to say that the Cybertruck is going to be worse. In fact, the data looks like that because it's so much lower, it might actually be better. Now it might be better in head injury, but then obliterate your internal organs. I don't right. know. But the point is I'm saying, I don't know. I'm not saying, I, and I'm saying decide for yourself and please let's wait to see what happens in the real world rather than speculating because that's sure. confusing opinion with fact. And um, I was really careful to do that. We have a story. Uh, David Zipper wrote uh, for Slate, um, which is, just came out um, yesterday. And David Zipper okay. is a great writer. I uh, met him at the um, the tech conference in Germany with Alex Roy and uh, and JF. And I really recommend he writes about urbanism and he writes a lot about uh, pedestrian safety and uh, mm -hmm. urban design and stuff like that. And um, the only reason I bring up this story is because he has multiple quotes in here from the IIHS, mm -hmm. which um, with their concern. With their concern, yeah, and and their mm -hmm. concern, uh, and the IIHS guy to to I think you would appreciate this said he hasn't looked at the crash test data and wouldn't make a conclusive thing just by looking at the video, but he was concerned about uh, the, the the about pedestrians, um, yeah. and 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 also concerned that the that America doesn't have the regulatory infrastructure for trucks and pedestrians, which is a big fucking problem. It's a big fucking problem. And you're, you were right to point out that the pedestrian death rate has doubled in the yeah. last whatever amount of years. And, you know, there are cell phones, you pointed that out. But the problem is these fucking trucks are huge. But yeah. that's not part of a Cybertruck review. You know, that was my point here today is sure. to say that's not part of a Cybertruck review. That's the fault of the government. And that's, a you know, we yep. should push back on them for sure and say, you guys need to do something about this because there's no reason why pedestrian deaths are going up in our country so so out of proportion to what's happening elsewhere. Sure, I will, sir, I, uh, you are right. However, asterisks, yeah. Elon has opened the door by saying that if you, in the Cybertruck, get into, and this is pur purely his language, which, which, you know, is maybe represents the company, maybe doesn't. And you know what I'm about to say. If oh, yeah. you get into an accident with another vehicle, you will you win. You will win. Win. Yep. It rep and maybe that was a thoughtless toss out statement. And, I, and you know, you, you probably know people that buy big ass fucking trucks without thinking, go, yeah, well, if I, someone hits me, I'm going to win. Okay. But just the idea of an accident having a winner um, and, and, and not considering as the manufacturer of a big, heavy, fast, heavy gauge steel bodied vehicle, um, it's a very callous thing to say about anyone okay. outside of the car, which adds okay. to my level of concern beyond what you've already said about we should be criticizing the government and everyone that is involved in making our our trucks and SUVs huge. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think we should all we should hold them all accountable, but we have to hold them all accountable evenly. And once we do that, I'm 100 percent behind you. The reality is I once totaled a Toyota Camry with my bare body. I was on a bike. So I was doing 30 miles an hour. I was my last day of physical therapy after a year of PT following a big car accident that I was in the passenger seat. And this woman the head librarian on campus made a left-hand turn in front of me because she saw a parking spot open up and I hit the side of her car and totaled it with my bare body. And I can say cars are fucking strong and that really hurt. It was another year of PT. It was a bunch of other shit. Um, and I'm permanently injured from this. It. I don't want to ever get hit by a car again. I won't ride a bike on public roads if I can find a trail or anything else. Um, I'm with you. I'm scared shitless about these things, especially in my... 1,683 pound Honda Beat, my 1,992 pound uh, Lotus Elise, my 2,356 pound Scirocco. I'm scared Bro, to I'm death. I'm on a Vespa. I ride a fucking Vespa to work, man. Good I, death I, wish, you know, right? like, I mean, I, yeah. like, I, 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 as for a big fucking fat guy, I, I am a, I'm a small footprint kind of fucking guy when I'm getting around LA. So, right. so things like, FSD doing crazy shit and being unpredictable mm -hmm. and things like huge SUVs and trucks, uh, you know, they may, and I wear my gear, but they make me nervous hey. and I can't help but 
but spend time focusing on what happens not just to the occupants in a crash, but to whatever you hit. Whatever you hit. I Yeah, I, I look, I totally agree with you. What I will say is that Elon Musk is not, even though he has said that he wants to make the world a better place, at the end of the day, Tesla is a publicly traded company, and that company is has one mission, not to make cars, but to make money. And the best way to make money is to give consumers what they want. The reality of the U.S. car market is that even though Elon said that, that is the embodiment of our entire self-arming country, right? Everyone 100%. wants a gun. God Everyone mind, wants to protect you. themselves. Exactly. And I don't I don't see the world that way. I think the world could be a better place if we, if we gave a, even a cursory shit about each other. Um, and I don't like it. I, you know, I chose a e-golf. That's my daily driver. And it's 3,400 pounds and I'm still fucking splattered by any Hummer EV and any F-150 and whatever. And, I'm, and that scares the shit out of me. But I'm not going to participate in this arms race. And what Elon did is say, now I'm participating in the arms race. And I don't particularly care for that either. But also, when you look at the sales volumes of the, the top sell, selling vehicle in the, in the United States, and we need to get to car sales first because it's the other one I re- you guys really think you caught me on and I got to defend myself. Um, when you're talking about the volume of these pickup trucks, how could a company that makes trucks not, uh, that makes vehicles not want to participate in the profits from that? And so I don't blame Tesla as a company for chasing the money because that's their mission as a publicly traded company. And this is capitalism and I hate it, uh, but it is what it is. But I do I, I do personally wish no one ever had the attitude of fuck you, buddy, I'm winning because I think that's incredibly selfish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Opinion. No, I, I, I agree. I agree with you in, in all of that. I just think that, again, Tesla opened the door. You know, they, they, they are, they, he's, he and they are, it's all about this making the world a a better place. And, and if, and you got to walk that walk. And I think they're going to convert more car buyers into truck buyers with this product than they are convert gas truck buyers into electric Tesla truck buyers. And I think that is, it will participate. And again, that's my opinion. The future may prove me wrong. But I think more people will come out of Model S's, Y's, and 3's and into Cybertrucks, heavier, less efficient uh, vehicles, than will come out of Ram uh, 2500 diesels uh, and into into Cybertrucks. And the future may bear this, this wrong, but that's how I see this going, especially with the attitude of, if you get into an accident, you're the winner. Because it's right. just so fucking callous uh, about what happens to anything outside the car. Listen, so long as we're clear about that this is speculation on your part and that it's speculation on my part, and I agree that it's, it is, it's an interesting point I hadn't thought about, um, and it is likely that more car people will buy uh, this than other people, and so the net weight rating of, of cars on the road might go up because of this. I think that's an interesting point. I just, I have to say, it doesn't, it's not relevant in a review of the car. Right. Sure. So and again, I hustle. could have I knocked your hustle by trying to make it relevant. And you have the right to review the car without being required to say all that shit. Right. I, I had to. There's been a lot of accusations of like Tesla paying me, which is fucking absurd or me being afraid to bite the hand that feeds me. Uh, um, I've been banned from far bigger car companies. <laughs> I've been banned oh, yeah. by everyone. I get paid for all. Co- I, I get. I get. I don't get paid. I get, I get accused <laughs> of being paid for all. I mean, yeah. you 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 drive a car and you say great things and you're being paid, and you drive a car and you say you don't like it, and someone's finally being honest. It's right. you know, it's that's. Um, it's it's a difficult game, but I mean, the reality is I do have to always think twice about biting the hand that feeds me because in 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 the sense that I have to remember what the repercussions are going to be. And so when I do bite the hand that feeds me, which I do all the time, I do it in a measured way that's defensible, right? So if I say this BMW is fucking hideous, um, I, I'm going to get shit from BMW on it and it's frankly deserved because that's my opinion. If I look at the camera and smile and I have two fake teeth in my thing and spit them out and give my line, I've made my point. But it's obvious that I'm not saying this car is 
uh, in words, this is hideous. Right. And I can defend that as a comedy moment. And so I had to, in the case of the Cybertruck, in exchange for this access, think about how I phrase things and think about how I phrase, how I, how I, I, I conduct a review, but it's no different than any other car company that's giving me a car or by the way, any car that I rent or any think, car that I borrow from an owner. In the case of this particular thing that because only three people got it, that it makes it easier for people. And I, for the record, I don't believe you fucking took money or anything like that, but like, but, but do you think the level of access, exclusive access, either makes you more likely to believe what's being told to you, or do you think that maybe you mm. understand why people might think that way? Because this is a company that has a reputation for not right. giving access to people that are known to criticize them in mm -hmm. ways that they don't like. Right. So for the record, Tesla called, they knew they know about what's going on and they offered, which I think was the ultimate cunt mic drop move. They offered to give me a cyber truck to drive down to show up to this podcast in. And I, I refused it. I thought that was a really funny idea. Um, but they're sort of petty in the funniest way. It, to me, that was funny. I'm, I'm sure it wouldn't have been funny to you, but it would have gotten you a chance to drive it. I just didn't I have it in me to drive, to drive it. I would have, I mean, if you I, did well, that, I, hope, I would have, I would have driven it and, and right. made a fucking video of it and whatever. But I have to be I have to be cognizant of what the optics of that are, right? I didn't do it, A, because I'm genuinely exhausted after a week of all I've done is this fucking PDF plus everyone's goddamn podcast about, you know, what's going on with this truck, whatever. So the, the, the bad side of having such exclusive access is that everyone wants to hear, everyone has their questions they want to ask. And I'm thrilled to, uh, that people think to ask me about that. Do I think that it looks bad that, you know, or it opens me up for additional criticism because I'm one of three people who got access to it and the only one who got access to the engineering stuff? Absolutely. fucking lutely And that absolutely f f factored into the way I reviewed that car. I made absolutely certain to not throw in opinion on almost anything, right? I called Elon a man child, which, you know, then I thought, okay, what's fair and balanced? I got to call myself a man child. So I did both, right? Th this is the benefit of having a scripted thing. I sit down and I write the script and I go, oh shit, I just called the richest man in the world a man child. And I'm sitting here holding uh, a wiper blade like a dick. Okay, let's call. Let's let's be fair and balanced here. I'm a man child, also, right? Um, I did say I hate the way it looks, and then I love it, and then I hate, it, and then I love it because that's true. I look at it, and I'm like, it's fucking horrible. And then you look at it, it's like so cool, and then it's horrible, and then it's so cool. So, but I really had to do a double check on me about everything, including the engineering. But you know, off the record between us, between us, I went into this. It's not off You're the not off this the, is record, very on the record, by the way. I know, I'm joking. I think you You're know very that. much I, on the record right no, now. No, I know, but I said <laughs> in the video, I went into this thinking it was a bad joke. I really did. And what the engineers did was show irrefutable facts of the accomplishments that they created in solving a problem. Do I personally like the problem that they were given? No. I don't particularly like the Cybertruck. I don't particularly like the way it looks. I don't particularly like its mission. I don't need one. I don't want one. But what I did was say, this is so emotionally charged that I'm going to take an objective look at the engineering. And so you see the, the, the original title that I had for the script was the engineering behind the Cybertruck until I realized that no one else saw this. And I'm like, no one's going to fucking click on that. And I need people to click on it um, because it's my job to get attention, right? I mean, it's a, t a job to get to get people to teach people. And if no one watches the show, I don't get to teach anyone. So, you know, Tesla approached me and the original email said, we'd like to give you access because you're the, the right person to tell our engineering story or some, well, that's not a quote. And my reaction was, fuck you, right? No one is gonna help say, I want you to tell my story. No, you're gonna give me access to it and then I'm gonna tell my fucking story. Um, and, but of course I said, yes, right. It's access to the cyber truck. And I went in with like, okay, let's see what this thing is underneath and proceeded to have my mind blown over and over and over. Not about the truck 
and about the, the problem that Elon presented the engineers with this truck, but about the solutions that the team was able to come up with to solve that problem. And I was fascinated by it. Like how you actually got 48 volt done. You actually got 310 miles. I wound up being 330, I think, but they told me 310 miles of range out of 123 kilowatt hour battery. Holy shit. Like you actually got, we didn't think it was going to be faster than testing that. on that. Yeah, their great. Do it. Their cars don't hit their estimated ranges. But listen, and and when I called when I called Rivian, I'm like, they're like, what do we give you? I'm like, give me the fastest fucking truck you can, right? This is a we're gonna drag race this thing. Give me summer tires. Never in my wildest nightmares because they did not tell me their expected acceleration. They just gave me a horsepower number, which was wrong. They gave me 700 kilowatts, which was 940. And an hour before we uploaded the video, we had to change all the graphics and cut some shit out. It was a it was a pain in the ass but we never thought it was going to beat the Rivian. Never. Like it was just one holy shit moment after a next, after the next in terms of the engineering, holy shit, the steering works. Holy shit. This works. Holy shit. The wiper works. Holy shit. What the fuck? Like, and then it just becomes this like smack my head moment of like, why would I ever second guess Tesla's engineers? It's so easy to second guess Elon, but these motherfuckers pull through every time. Well, I think it's, I mean, I mean, have you seen videos of full self-driving on the street? I think that's oh, okay. totally it. okay to criticize their it. fucking engineers. That's a janky ass system. Does it weird is... shit all the time. Didn't they have a lower control so arm failure is. issue? Uh, yeah, but they don't, everyone else puts puts a lot more restrictions in where it can be used. They don't. They're not. They're not saying you can drive hands off in the middle of a city. My personal opinion on this is that FSD should not be called FSD. This should be called Enhanced Autopilot Plus or whatever some other thing. I yeah. think it, the name promises a level of autonomy that the car can't deliver. And I think that Tesla needs to do a better job than just a boilerplate lawyer accept screen uh, to educate its cons consumers about what the system is capable of and what the system is not capable of. And That's people, my, my And there's so many people who... It's a there's a level of double speak there, you know, where that where people are able to to sort of lean back on that legal thing, like fans, you know, fans of the company and these freaky blue check people that we that, that we know exactly what it can and can't do. Meanwhile, you know, so many people quote. You know, there's there's mainstream media and there's people that make videos of, you know, look, ma, no hands kind of thing. Um, Listen, it, it you, you know, yeah. do, do we want to live in a world where we where somebody has to design an electrical outlet so you can't stick a fork in it? Right. This is the problem. I like, don't want to live in a world where people think their cars are going to drive themselves and I'm riding a motorcycle next to them. I don't want to live in that fucking world, bro. Same, same. And I think the solution isn't necessarily putting a, a cover over the electrical outlet so you can't shove a fork in it. I think the solution is trying to teach people to think critically for themselves and understand the world they live in. And the, the problem is we don't oh god i'm getting political i don't as a society we just don't fucking value this anymore and we're not taught our education system doesn't say question reality and question authority in a positive way it's it's align yourself with the person who sounds like you and then take what they say as opinion as fact and we're back to the beginning and this is why i was so upset because you are so outspoken in your political beliefs I, i'm not going to argue any of them they're your beliefs your beliefs and i want you to have them i want everyone else to have them i want everyone else to decide where to spend their money look i drove i drive i the only new car that i own is a is a, a volkswagen meaning that my money flowed directly to the company that hitler built okay does that mean that i'm a nazi of of course not. But it means that I've made the decision that even though Dr. Ferdinand Piesch was involved and his dad was once in jail for, for, for Nazi war crimes that he was not actually convicted of and whatever, blah, blah, blah. But technically, I was willing to say, I've worked really hard for this money and I'm going to give it to this organization despite its its heinous activities or past or possible. Shall, well, that's up to me. That's up to me to decide. I personally don't think my money went and funded people who are anti-Semites in the same way that I don't think your money for your Mach-E went to go back to fund Henry Ford's I Hate Jews campaign, right? Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I but, hear uh, you on that. But, um, and, you know, it's funny that you bring that up given Elon Musk's recent fucking tweets. But, but I he's think making it tough. He's making it tough. But I, but I, I think that 
to look at and consider a company's past. You know, my grandmother wouldn't ride in a Mercedes. All right, cool. Right. You know, got it. Uh, a company's past. You're talking 80 years ago. You know, no one's still alive. But I think I don't think when I talk about Tesla and their uh, missteps, I think I'm I'm talking about them much more in the present. Present. Okay, yeah. but to, to, to let me ask a question though. In all seriousness, I've gotten shit about my lucid opinions, uh, you know, or lucid, lucid air and sapphire reviews, and mm -hmm. people are like, "How do you wrap your head around the fact that this is all evil?" I my not my fucking words. Evil Saudi oil money, and I say I don't. It's up to the customer to decide whether they want to. They they can research and they can do a critical analysis and they can look and see where the money flows. And then they've made that money. They work really hard for it. I hope. And so let them decide where they can, where they're willing to support and where they're not willing to support. I'm going to review it as a consumer product. And that's what I do with Tesla versus Lucid versus, you know, I'm not buying in a Jaguar because it's Indian and India this and blah, 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 Tata. Okay, fine, sure. But I can't make that part of my review. Here is it. Hey, this, this Land Rover Defender is great and it does what it says it should do, blah, blah, blah. Please go and make your own decision. About I where really, I, you, you, you have a, you absolutely have a point, but I'm going to go back to the same thing that I'm not I'm not talking about where the company's funding is coming from. I'm not talking about what country the cars are built in uh, or, or what country is 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 uh, funding, you know, is Volvo and Lotus under Chinese ownership, you know, whatever. That's that's not I'm really talking about a company that, in my opinion, is actively selling something. De in a deeply misleading way, and I'm talking about the semi-autonomous features, right now, today, you can buy it now, and 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 because I have to share the roads with these people, I have not consented to be part of their beta test, and and a company that that recognizes, like myself, look, I when uh, when I did that last show. I, I don't hold myself to a higher standard. I hold myself to pretty fucking low standards. I, w when I found out that 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 I had upset you, right away, phone call. Accept that I did something wrong, apologize for it, talk to you on the phone for half an hour, and then find a way to, as best I possibly can, smooth it out with an even hand going forward, and hopefully we have a positive, truthful, productive relationship going forward. Mm. I have not seen Tesla do any of those things. Instead, I've seen them double and triple down and fight regulation and fight lawsuits and fight those things, as opposed to saying, you know, we, we promised this thing and really it, it wasn't ready and really some people have died and, uh, and, and we're going to reconsider our position on this. I haven't seen any ownership. I've seen denials. I so, think you, so you're seeing the lack of PR into. department. Yeah. And I think you're seeing a lack of PR department. And I really wish personally that and, and professionally that Tesla had a PR department because the only person doing PR for that company is Elon. And I have said before, I'll say it again, I think that his superpower, which is my, I'll pull my psych degree out and say he's probably all over the spectrum, um, that that is his superpower is also his super weakness. Um, the, you know, his ability to push t through technical in innovation and, you know, buy all these companies and make all this shit happen is fucking, he's changing the world. He's pushing the world forward. And I think in genu generally a positive way, but at the same time, he, there's that equal and opposite force of him destroying his own credibility by abandoning the original people who were behind him and now, and now trying to appeal to, or not trying, now appealing to the, the people who hated him. Why do we have to be so divisive? I think he's just really bad at PR. Although, hey, 60 million views on a fucking truck and, you know, out of independent journalists, I don't, I, maybe not. I don't know. But I just, I wish that he would yield his power a little bit more carefully. And which means when you fuck up, you say it. When you, when you have a matter of opinion, you describe that as opinion. And there are everyone, because we've lost the checks and balances of traditional media, everyone looks at a person and takes what they say as a fact. 
I don't take what Elon Musk says as a fact unless he's saying V equals I squared R, it, you know, if, it, or whatever the fuck formula, you know, he's, he's spouting out. What I take it is a person who, for example, the go fuck yourself thing, which I found pretty offensive, um, not in the language. I, I don't care about that, obviously, but he was backed into a corner and his reaction was to lash out. And I just don't think that's appropriate to set an example for the people who look up to him. That's not how you treat somebody when you're backed into a corner. Right? I mean, do you I, think it's do you think it's appropriate to say that this car is driving itself and the only reason that a person is there is because the law says a person has to be there, but really the car can drive itself. And if you buy this car today and pay me this money, then during your ownership period of this car, it will drive itself. Do you, do you think that's okay to do that? I think that's a stretch, but I also have to separate that from the engineering behind Cybertruck, right? And I have to separate that. But the, the Cybertruck is sold with that technology, isn't it? Isn't yes, that, but that's it, that's one part of it, right? I can I can very easily agree with you and say, look, FSD is not FSD, and uh, and that is a stretch of a claim. And Tesla covers its ass corporate wise with boilerplate text on the screen that says you must take whatever blah 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 blah. But uh, will I go so far as to hate on the rest of the truck or, or decide that there is some sort of duping going on or lack of trustworthy in the rest of the engineering for the truck? No. And I think yeah, that's where think, you and I are different. I think so, too. I, I don't necessarily think that difference is – I think when we talked on the phone and maybe maybe just a few minutes ago, you referred to that difference as political, which I I disagree with that characterization. I don't think it's political. I think – I think – I just – I just have a I have a – I have a long memory when people do th double down and don't – don't make amends and 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 apologize or or even really correct the their their behavior and and I think that um, that that has continued in such a flagrant way like I'm not able to separate that f from other go other good work that that yeah. well intentioned people are doing well and you put a lot of weight in that topic so it, this is like bop that's what makes me think of so like jason said he's he's trying to just review the consumer product what the fuck was that oh sorry uh he's trying to re review the product and you know piece by piece how's the steering how's the driving how's the braking and then whether or not he chooses to include the part about tesla's you know marketing ambitious marketing is up to him and you like you just said like you have a long memory and you want to put a lot of uh focus on those particular things they've done. And I just think that's that's what I said in, in the show before. I think there's different ways to have, to you know, analyze the truck and have the conversation about the company. Did and you just say analyze? No, but uh, our center card for the show did say Cybertruck anal on mobile until I changed oh, it. Oh, really? It did, because it cut off analyze. <laughs> should, we should maybe just leave that. It's good for uh, SEO, probably. Yeah, right. We Zach, no, Zach uploading actually- to, Uploading the podcast to Pornhub. Fuck it, let's just go, go full. So the reason the internet was existed is porn um, or is invented in the first place. No, no, I, I, Zach, I give you a lot of credit because in the end of the, at the, the end of that last podcast, you said there are three ways you can go about re, uh, of this. Number one, you can review the product. Number two, you can review the company that's making the product. And then number three, you can look at the larger societal implications of that product. And that I chose to do number one. I did. And I, and I, you and I, do things differently, Matt. All right. I mean, this, your podcast is really your column, right? In my column in Road and Track, I could say whatever I wanted. No one edited it. It went out. In my emails to my friends, I can say whatever I want. I think, I believe that we are in a post fact world, right? That sort of happened because of social media where the checks and balances, I said before, our checks and balances are fucking gone. I don't have a fact checker walking around with me and I don't have uh, you know, a, 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 the rest of the staff of a magazine saying, Ooh, did you know that that abbreviation has meaning somewhere else in the world that they just happen to know that I didn't, I'm going to get myself in trouble. And that's a, the scariest part about being out as a, as a public figure is whatever I say can be taken out of context. And I don't have the protection of an entire magazine and a, a, a entire media organization protecting me. And I want personally, or I wish 
you saw that responsibility the same way I do, because I don't want to live in a world where we're disagreeing about facts. I want us to all, when I say politics, I don't mean like actual like Washington politics. I mean like the way you look and the way you appear and, and the way a company looks and the way it appears. Um, I want us all to be able to agree on the facts first and then pull the fucking gloves off and fight the shit out of each other about our opinions based on those facts. And I do a really, really hard job and I, and I try really hard. I'm not always successful at pulling my own personal opinions out of these things and appearing as an automotive journalist. You use the term, and I'm, I'm going to get personal and beat you up a little bit. I'm sorry. I don't mean this, but you use the term automotive journalist. You said, I'm a journalist. As a journalist, I feel like it's my right to point this out, or it's my responsibility to point that out. You're a man of integrity, and I appreciate that. If you weren't a man of integrity, we wouldn't have this conversation. You would have never called me, and I would have dumped this fucking dissertation on the goddamn internet, and everyone would have been bored and said, oh, it's a smackdown. And we would have been just as guilty as every asshole in politics who refuses to talk to each other frankly, but you're not, you, you wanted to talk to me about this. And I really, 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 really appreciate that. But I really wish for all of us that everyone in this business, whether it's throttle house or it's all the influencers, you know, who are purporting to be experts in the subject matter, took the time to become experts in the subject matter, and then took the time to differentiate between opinion and fact. And then once we're all agreed on the same facts, right? Uh, the sales number for Model Y is one of the things that we haven't talked about, right? There are, there are competing facts there. You're right to have called it out. There was a really difficult one for me to fact check. Um, I think I got the right answer. And I, I know when I watched your video back, you guys were working on the wrong information because you were looking at last year's worldwide sales and then this year's Q3 US only sales. And I just want the opportunity to go back, like, let's go look at this together and agree where, on- Where can I find the right number, Jason? Tell me, okay, I, I, right I, please, let's, let's, because we dude. were genuinely, we were genuinely good faith trying to figure this one out. Okay, me and for the record, me too. So when so what happened was you you went up to Statista and you showed the number showed, four that best was selling 2022. car in the world. Twenty twenty two. Twenty two. Right. And we're December halfway through December twenty three, so that's just outdated information. Right. Uh, the next one that you showed was Car and Driver's list of the quote best twenty five uh, twenty five best selling cars, trucks, and SUVs in the US. So you guys didn't see that little, I'm not, I don't, I'm not accusing you of ignoring it, but it's easy to, to overlook. You didn't see that that was US sales only. And that okay, one so put- where are the right, global sales? To be fair in the title, it doesn't say that. It says- It does, this in the US. Best. What? Where does it say this in the title, Jason? It's a subtitle. We've, we've pulled it up right now. No, uh, where? No, no, that's 2022. No, 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 that's the oh, wrong article. You guys had no, 2023 is, oh, Q3. 2023. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. different. This is why I loved fact checkers. Rusty Blackwell was a guy who worked for me at Automobile and everyone hated him because he 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 was paid. We didn't hate him. We hated his position because he was paid to pick apart every argument. And I, I never want to go out in the world without Rusty Blackwell because he would find this shit. Mm. Yep, you're right. So this, this one does say U.S. right there. Yeah. OK. All right. And so, so where did you get the, the right information? I then? spent three hours trying to fucking figure this one out. So I'm glad you pointed out because I'm not 100 percent certain that I was right. So what I found was that Motor One published a, a document. The, the links are in the PDF. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Jado data for 53 market worldwide, plus information from other key markets and estimates for others indicate that the Tesla Model Y was the world's best selling car in the first quarter of the year. That was my first piece of information. That's mm -hmm. the one that got shot, shot out and moved all over about the car being the number one bestseller that sparked all of the other incorrect journalism. Then I found that the Jado data shows Tesla Model Y leading in Europe through Q3. That's the only Q3 information that I was able to find. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, Q3 is leading in Europe. Q1 was best selling. That starts to paint a picture. And then the final one was uh, Jado senior analyst Felipe Munoz expects the Model Y will be the world's top seller by year end in 2023. And that was a Reuters article um, from June. And so what I did was then I started to compile country, I, three hours, country by country by country, region by region, individual sales data. And I looked at how well Model Y was doing relative to Corolla, which was the number two car. And it looked like it was going to win. And I had three different versions in the script. Tesla Model Y is one of the best selling cars in the world. Tesla why is, sorry, reported to be, and I'll just keep doing funny graphics in the background, reported to be 
among the best selling cars in the world, or and then it is. And all indications led to it is. And so it was not bulletproof. It's not 100%. And that may be a misstep on my part. I do believe, I do expect, excuse me, that when the data is compiled, Tesla Model Y will be the best selling vehicle, not truck, not sedan, not SUV, not crossover. Those are governmental distinctions, not mine, because you guys were kind of talking about that too. I don't decide what's a crossover versus what's a car. The government does, but that's why I specifically said vehicle and in the world. So I do expect that's true. It can, I will certainly apologize to everyone if it turns out it's number two to Corolla. But I think the point there is it is close in the race, no matter what. And it's expected to be the number one selling car in the world. And the point there was actually shitting on Tesla. If they had to learn anything from the fucking Model X, uh, you know, and model versus Model Y, they would have made Cybertruck easy. They wouldn't have done any of this unbelievably difficult stuff to do. They would have made it simple like Model Y is. And Model Y outsells Model X by 26 times, I think. So yeah, you're right to have pointed out, like I did repeat that, but I went through hell trying to trying to get that. But you guys were, you you did take it seriously, but you missed one was last year's data and one was US data. And I'm, of course, you can imagine I'm watching this I'm fucking fuming while it's on your screen saying in the US, like I'm going to fucking kill them. Like stop shitting on my fucking data. Call me and ask me where I got it from. But I'm not actually still mad. You know, <laughs> Okay. Sorry. Okay. No. Okay. Cool. Like I, you know what? Like, you know, you're all right. You're you're right. That's that's cool. But I, it made me. I was just having a side thought as you were as you were saying that, and I was listening to you, but I was having a side thought, which is that I really feel like because you were talking about you know three hours to find a fact and 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 how difficult it is to find facts how much energy you have to expel to find facts and how much mm -hmm. how much has to go into that you know my thought is it's it's very it's very hard when you're making these youtube videos and and podcasts and individual articles for magazines there's not a lot of money you know in it on an individual level you know that's why i feel like i have to do everything and run a brick and mortar business mm -hmm. and there's and there's you have to crank out so much content and i'm not and and again i i i I really respect, um, you know, you and and the amount of thought that you that you've put into all of this. Um, but it's and I think I need to rethink how much volume of content I need to crank out versus how much time I should be spending on some content, and maybe I should stop trying to focus on volume and start trying to find ways to to put more time into each thing but you know it's it's such a volume game it's just that's it's unfortunate but that's what it's been reduced to that you know i literally will have to trade right you you have just pointed out the saddest part of our industry which is that the social media youtube model is broken um, the people who make the most money or the people who are most successful are concentrating on volume and just clicks, 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 clicks. And that necessarily means high volume, low quality, right? The YouTube, so icons as a show is not the correct, it's YouTube is not the correct medium for icons. Netflix is the correct of course. medium for icons. After, even after I saw your fucking video and had multiple millions of views, my first thought was, I bet he still lost money on that. Oh, so right, exactly. And oh, tell you, we a hundred percent did. And when I say we, I mean Haggerty. And so this is where I've landed really well. Is that I am not incentivized by sponsorship. I'm not incentivized by ad revenue, and I'm not incentivized by views. I'm a salaried employee, and the way I see my job is it is my job to drive eyeballs to get to get eyeballs onto. 
Haggerty's name, right? Haggerty pays me so that I can drive awareness of the brand, which ultimately long-term down the road is something we don't measure and I'm not, I, I will never be able to measure that drives consideration for using their services, their, their classic car insurance, which then ultimately drives profits, right? You know, and, and, and people signing up for policies. I do not have any way of tracking how many policies are written because of my content. I have no, up until now, I have no way of knowing how many people came to our quotes um, because of, uh, of, of our video. We tried to put a link in the description, but that was me just trying to say, hey, look, I'm, I'm trying to justify my job. But the reality is it's a long-term play for brand recognition and marketing for, for, for an insurance company. I don't, you know, they sell a sponsorship to Valentine One, for example. I didn't get a cent of that. Now, let's be honest, I want that, right? I mean, I'm sitting there literally kissing my fucking radar detector on a camera, which is a personal endorsement, but Haggerty sold that as a sponsorship. And so would I take money from, from Valentine, Valentine Research? Yeah, because frankly, I love my V1. I bought it 20 something years ago. I, I, I did kiss it because it has saved me from so many speeding tickets, it's not possible. But the reality is I am an employee of a company who, and I'm not incentivized by any sponsorship or any anything. Your, you I mean, your, your, your job is independent of the medium of YouTube. Right. It's just, it's, it's, which, it's, which ours right. unfortunately Yours isn't. isn't. And that's why I say the media division, the media world is broken because once you have the commercial commercialization of news, right, where you got to get clicks and you got to, you're going to profit from this, your priorities shift, even if it's just a little bit to, to clickbait and the, the money isn't there. So the efficiency can has to grow, which means you can't fact check everything. You can't, you, you don't have somebody looking over it. Right. I mean, I'm so lucky that I have Anthony Esposito on my side, uh, you know, when we were writing scripts to go, hold on, it's not 5.30 to 60, it's, you know, 5.2. Um, he's my sort of gut check fact checker, and he knows just as much of, about cars as any other journalist does. And without him, I would fuck up all the time. And, you know, so in the process of creating the scripts, he's already fact checking me. And then I go through and I fact check myself. And I'm lucky Dude, that I sad, have the time to do the it. The sad fucking truth is this for the for most of 2023, you know, Zach and I tried to make scripted films because we were told by analysts that that they will perform better. And what we found out after making 20 scripted films is I don't it. Well, they did, but they took five times more energy to make for 50 percent more money. And it was not it's worth, not worth it. it. We were it's literally losing no. money. And so I think I think this whole thing. And I'm not trying to defer blame from my from myself. I accept any and all blame from not just you, uh, and I'm sure we're going to part this podcast, friends. But yeah. but 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 the audience who wants to be mad at me, or some Tesla engineers who want to be mad at me, you know, I I'll, I'll own it. But I think it's a great example of what a salaried employee can do with with their resources versus what a gig worker has to do in an in an on-demand volume-based right. world and i wish we had a way in our current media to differentiate between the two and i'm never going to say i'm better than matt farrow or i'm you know i'm better than throttle house or i'm better than anyone else but the, the economics of what's going on in the background means i'm different and there's no way for people to understand that difference, right? I mean, I, I, I stand in awe of the empire that you've built of your audience um, and finances, finances, and you know, and the the business that you've been able to create on the side. That's all amazing. I don't do that. I spend every day researching and fact checking and whatever else. And there seems to be no differentiation. And what scares me the most is that the audience hasn't been told to think critically and they can't recognize the difference between an opinion-based podcast and fact-based journalism. And 
the this is the problem in to expand it out the larger world right now where people are discussing or debating what's fact because it used to be that walter cronkite or you know or car and driver magazine or whatever else had a whole organization behind it making sure that what went out was unfair and unbiased and we had the fairness doctrine which was part of the news where you had to present both sides of a story all that shit's gone and what's left is a bunch of you know windbags spouting out their opinions, me included, right? But and it's very easy to do that. And I do it on the, the curmudgeon show, my podcast all the time, but I'm, you know, but that is an opinion piece and I make sure to as best I can. And I don't always do it right. Um, to separate those things. And still I see clippings in the news. Jason said, fuck Ferrari. Jason said this, Jason said, fuck, fuck this car, whatever. Well, no, 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 hold on. That's Jason talking to his friend on a podcast. Um, and this is really tough. And I, the world I live in where, you know, I'm creating genuine, genuinely produced stuff. And when I say produced, it's not, it doesn't mean it's not real. It's just, it's thought out and it's planned and scripted. Um, that is, it doesn't function on on modern social media. Something like Revelations, where I'm in a studio and it's very inexpensive to produce by comparison, is almost, it's probably profitable, but I need to have a patron uh, until Netflix calls and says, wow, you're you know the replacement for Top Gear that we've been looking for. Um, there's no fucking way to make money at what I do. And I'm lucky in that I have a patron that just says, as long as people are learning what ha the name Haggerty means, you're good. Go go forth and do your job. I'm lucky. And so I don't envy your position because you have to create volume, 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 volume at very little expense in order to make this stuff profitable. And yeah, I have I have multiple channels. I have the Instagram channel. I'm, I'm, I'm exploring the idea of actually using my YouTube channel to for monetization because the reality is there's a lot of money on the table that uh, is value to my brand that I'm not bringing to my employer. So they're not going to be willing to pay me what I'm worth on the other side of this. But that necessarily means being OK with no production value stuff. And that's kind of not my brand. It's not what I do. It's not what I want to do. I love the idea of storytelling on TV. And I love the idea of coming up with stupid tricks and stupid stunts and, you know, making people laugh. That's the best part of what we get to do. Um, I don't, I don't want to just make a YouTube video. Hi guys, it's me asshole. And I get to, no, it's not, no, that's not me. That's not what, that's not taking advantage of the medium, but there's no way to make money unless you do it that way. Yeah, I, you're right. And it's fucking sad. Sucks. Um, it's really sad. Look, uh, we have to end this show, not because I wouldn't talk to you all day, but because Zach actually has a doctor's appointment he has to get to, and we've done two and a half hours. Yeah, I was going to say, my, my AirPods already died once. Which so, you know. Um, but look, I love you. Um, love you too. Thank you for this, really. I, yeah, I, um, you, I, I, we owed it to you. I mean, we, 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 we owed you all the airtime you could, you could have. And um, for everything I got wrong in the last show, I officially stand corrected. If fucking someone at Tesla would like to send me a Cybertruck to drive... Let's fucking let's go. Maybe not as a not as a fuck you PR stunt. Maybe as a as someone who drives shit for a living. That would be all right. Um, I, I have a feeling they're, they'll be paying attention to this video. <laughs> well, it, so you, you hopefully, know, hopefully that's you know it. where I'm at. So 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 get at me. And um, you know, I I hope we get to ha have a drink and a laugh uh, at some point in the future. And and everything I uh, uh, you know everything I said at the beginning, I I genuinely meant. And uh, and I appreciate you doing this. I appreciate you doing. This. You have no idea how much I appreciate this. This is this is the way. Let's set this as an example for the way this happens when there's disagreements. Let's talk about it because I we both probably wanted each other dead last week, and now we can just move on and with, with no, un, I, untouched no, I respect. I didn't. Want okay, you I dead. wanted. I, I, I don't I want did, you dead. I I didn't. I didn't want that. I didn't want that. And I I just I think I learned. Uh, I learned the hard way. Uh, as I learn, I only learn things the hard way, by the way, I don't learn lessons. I only learn them the hard way. Um, why not to do, why not to do those things? And so for the rest of the audience, uh, thank you for still being here and, um, yeah. I'll see you soon, buddy. Thanks. Okay. Sounds great. Thanks. Okay. Bye.